please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, good evening, everyone. I will call the April 3rd Select Board Meeting to order at 5.30. I don't believe there are any changes to the agenda, so we'll accept it as written. And we really don't have any announcements tonight, just that we are being video and audio recorded, and any opening Select Board reports or comments. Brooke? Hi. Um, I just wanted to read a little statement. Um, our community has once again been forced to open our eyes to the disturbing reality that the use of racist language happens here. Words matter, words cause harm. So many of us never have to personally experience the pain that these words inflict. I believe we all bear the responsibility to protect our entire community from this type of harm. And I sincerely hope that we can use this experience as a reminder that we should be proactively working to make sure that all of us and our children are educated about the history and ongoing experience of racism endured by some members of our community. I hope we can provide safe opportunities for those who have been harmed to speak their truth and to be heard, and that we find ways to do better all the time, not only in these moments when we're forced to look at that truth. Thank you, Brooke. Matt? No, I just saw uh, online that Provincetown has uh, started a lease to locals program and they use placemates who we are using and I've asked for an update soon on that program here because I think it's going well, uh, but I have some questions. So I'd love to have it on a slow week in the next couple of weeks. It would be great to have that update here. I know they've updated the affordable housing trust fund, but it'd be nice for us to be updated as well. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Um, next up, we have follow-up from a prior meeting in regard to the short-term rental registration program. Uh, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, so <clears throat> the rollout, as everybody knows, has um, the registry is opened, and there's been some questions about it and some concerns. The first thing I want to let everybody know is that the April 4th date that we've been getting letters from in the, the at the uh, health department um, has been suppressed um, as the health director Roberto Santa Maria previously had acknowledged that the first year of it, this registration process was really for data gathering when we roll it out in November for the second year of registration it'll be more of a requirement to be registered. Um, to that end, with some of the issues that have cropped up, we have engaged uh, process first um, with Matt Heffenriffer and some of his other staff to be more of a point person to aggregate all of the issues and work directly with GovOS, um, consulting and working with both John Hedden and myself, um, but with process first really taking a lead to help us through this part of the process. Um, we have had a couple conversations already with uh, GovOS about some of the concerns with only 932 letters going out when I think we all know that there's substantially more. They gave us a background on how they scrape the data. We've had discussions about the data and how it's being used. Um, I know that there's a lot of uh, desire for some groups to be involved. We um, have and will be going back to the same people that were involved in the selection of GovOS, um, who are certainly subject matter experts between Lisa Wynn and Penny Dye who were very instrumental in working with us and getting GovOS selected. Uh, Kathy Baird was also on that group, and if we have questions or need additional testing or want additional um, input, I think that the expectation is that we would go back to that same group that helped us pick um, the vendor for this. Um, GovOS is extremely aware of some of the issues and understands the critical nature of getting this up to, I'll say, versions 2.0 or 3.0. Um, Matt and for process first will be probably meeting with them pretty much every week on a regular basis and then John and I will be having follow-up discussions um, for any critical decision paths that we need to make so that we're still in control of the process so it is being worked on we acknowledge that there's some things that we have to work out um, but we are moving forward and we've been meeting with them at least once or twice a week for the last couple of weeks so I, I feel like we are moving forward and they're working on some of the issues already identified Thank you. 
Um, next up, we have. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, on that, um, Kathy Baird. First, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for recognizing me, and thank you to Brian Turbot for that uh, that update. Just one quick question. I also I know that the um, th that the town has put a website up that has information about the registry, um, and also wondering. I, I believe their contract does include um, be, being a hotline for any kind of nuisance complaints or concerns that, that that citizens have as well. And I think that's part of their contract. So I was curious as to why there isn't really like a hotline, you know, information on the town's website, or is that something that the town does not really want to? Um, to push at this point, it's mostly focused on the registry. So that was just a thought. Um, it is live. There, are, there is a, a, a vendor who's who's there to to take in that information, and it would be nice if if people were aware of it. Thank you. I guess we'll get back to you on that. Okay. Reb Rebecca Tuham. Hi, so yeah, thank you, Brian, for the update on that. Um, a follow-up question then, if Matt Heffenrepper is going to be a point person for working with GovOS on issues, where should we be following up with issues we've identified? Should we continue simply reporting them to GovOS? I'm sorry, did you lose me? Sorry, that was me. Excellent, no. we lost you for a second. Yeah, so the, the question would be, um, for any open issues that GovOS is failing to respond to or any other new issues, what's the process? Should we be following up with GovOS with a carbon copy to Matt Heffenreffer or how do you want Matt to get visibility to the issues that are that are still being tracked and really need to be fixed? If you wanna answer this offline, that's fine too. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to both of you with answers to those questions. Um, next up, we have the public comment portion our, on our, uh, of our agenda for things that are otherwise not on our agenda for discussion. Um, any topics are limited to a three-minute comment. Christy? Hi, Christy Farantella. Uh, I just wanted to let the public know that um, the Housing Office is organizing a trip to Boston on Thursday, April 11th for a Housing Advocacy Day. Um, this is in relation to Governor Healy's housing bond bill, which includes a real estate transfer fee. We are taking students from the 8th grade Civics League, and we're inviting the public. If you're interested in joining us, uh, you can reach out to my office um, at Ellis Ramos, e Ramos at Nantucket-MA.gov, and uh, we'd be happy to have you join us for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else this evening? And I don't see any hands online. So um, we have no new business. We have approval of minutes, payroll warrants, treasury warrants, and pending contracts. Are there mm -hmm. any comments or questions on any of those? Move approval. Second. Sarah, second. Okay. All those in favor of one through four? Aye. 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 That carries unanimously. It's funny, we have everyone tonight. I know. That's nice. <laughs> Um, next up, we have consent items, gift acceptances to planning and land use services. Madam Chairman, read that. Sure. Uh, there is a gift of $6,000 from Ryan Fitch for pedestrian and bike path improvements in connection with the rear lot subdivision special permit at 73 Fairgrounds Road. Would entertain a motion to accept all gifts for their designated purposes with and send thanks to the donors. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That carries unanimously. Um, next up, we have Citizen Departmental Committee requests and reports. First up, we have the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee quarterly report when Leah Hill is here. Good evening, Leah Hill, Coastal Resilience Coordinator. Um, so this quarter report is the fourth one from um, October to December 2023. I know we are now in April, so I'll probably be back shortly to give the first quarter of 2024. Um, Erica, if you can go to the next page. Okay. So um, some highlights from the quarter. Crack started to work on a high priority recommendation within the Coastal Resilience Plan. It's number 1-1, which is outreach on property owner resilience best practices. 
um, they wrote a broad support letter for the updated and proposed wetland regulations as it aligns with the um, CRP findings. They produced an annual report, developed outreach plan, and were given multiple presentations by regional experts. Next slide, please. So from the public outreach um, section, again, Crack was working on a high recommendation within the CRP. We created a schedule and content that's all coastal resilience related, and that is posted on the natural resources social media pages. So on Instagram, our handles at NRDACK, and then Facebook, it's Town of Nantucket Natural Resources Department. Every Thursday, we are posting about you know, stuff from erosion to sea level rise to what people can do on their property to become more resilient. And those are translated into Spanish, thanks to Florencia from the communications office. Um, we have also reached out to uh, different aligned organizations and they share it on their social media as well. And then one of our crack members, Doug Rose, he keeps track of all the impressions. And to date we've had, we're up to about 93,000 impressions and those cost $0. So um, it's a good way to get the information out. The organizations that are aligned with, con with the content that we're putting out have also said that we could put some content into their newsletters. And um, there's 10 or so local organizations that are doing that. I won't go through all of them. Um, I'm also working with the communications office to update the Coastal Resilience webpage so that it is relevant and easy to navigate and has a lot more information on there for the public to go and um, learn more about coastal resilience. And then um, we're also working to develop an informational brochure for real estate agents and home buyers about coastal resilience and you know the information that they should know before they purchase a home. Um, and I'm working with a local real estate agent, Shelly Lockwood, and then Isabel Perkins, who's a certified real estate continuing education uh, teacher. And I'll be putting on a class in, I think it's June 10th, co-teaching that about coastal resilience for uh, continuing education for real estate agents. Next slide, please. We also developed a survey questionnaire um, that was sent out to the 25 area associations through the Civic League. And from that, we wanted to just gain some insight from property owners Specifically, you know, are they practicing resilient efforts now? Are they planning to? What are they worried about? How can we help them within kind of our charge to uh, give them more information? And that survey, we have the results now. We had about 300 participants. Um, on Tuesday, we'll be going over the survey results and figuring out what we're going to do with that information um, and then try to open it up to like the broader. Um, area associations that may have not been included in this first go around. Next. I gave a presentation on uh, generally, you know, what I present to for area associations. In the summer, I gave four of these presentations. So generally, it starts with I identify the coastal risks that are on island, erosion, flooding, uh, groundwater table rise. I talk about the different models that are available and the probabilities of flooding and erosion currently and in the future. I give an overview about the coastal resilience plan, dive into the CRP recommendations that are specific to their area. I talk about what CRAC does, and then I end with what homeowners can do for their property to make it more resilient. So it's not all doom and gloom. I try to end on um, an empower empowering note. Next slide. We had a great presentation by Kurt Bosma from the Woods Hole Group, and he talked about something called dynamic adapt ad adapted. Sorry, I cannot say that right now. Um, policy pathways, so DAPS for short. So basically, what it is, it's a phased management approach for really complex projects like coastal resilience projects. It has some great benefits. It buys time and removes pressure. It reduces uncertainty by using events, not time for decision-making tools. It offers flexibility to reflect changing circumstances, 
So it doesn't really box you into a certain project and it keeps options open until there's more information or funding or support. It allows for learning along the way and it can handle really complex decision-making projects. The DAPS process is you ID the problem. So is it erosion? Is it flooding? You ID the key assets. So you know maybe a structure or a roadway, and then you develop regional themes. So manage retreat, natural resources, protection, connection, et cetera, and then potential actions that are on the short, medium, and long-term um, time frame. You assess the efficacy of the actions, and then you develop a DAPS map, which is on the next page, and there's a lot going on on this next slide, so I'll try to um, explain it. It's kind of hard to see on the screen right now. But uh, this was used in Falmouth, Mass. for Surf Drive, which is a low-lying road. It's right near the water, and it constantly gets flooded during coastal storms. It allowed the town um, an initial action plan with flexibility to switch paths in the future if you know, goals change or funding or conditions change. And it defines key triggers to adjust, adjust the time frame. So um, the key for it is the green line is the natural resources theme. The bl dark blue is the connection theme. The orange is the protection theme. The light blue is managed retreat. And then the dashed red line is the preferred pathway. So on the, on the left-hand side is the different actions. So bridge construction, end of road maintenance, uh, public outreach, beach and dune restoration, all these different actions that could potentially be taken. And then on the bottom left, or sorry, on the bottom is the time frame and also the sea level rise projection. So basically what it is, it's a map. You start where the dashed line is, when a trigger point happens. So um, let's say there's some dune restoration, that's kind of a roundabout, and then you keep following that. And these different triggers can change as time evolves and as community input um, evolves as well. So it's a really innovative way to think about coastal resilience projects, which are so complex. Next slide. Before you, before you leave that, sure. what was interesting to me in this whole uh, is in this whole presentation on the DAPS is this is what we've been uh, trying to do at Baxter Road. The, the town has been trying to do it without even knowing they were doing the right thing. We were trying to say, you know, we can't give a certain date to it. There have to be triggers. And no, you're not going to be able to keep it there forever. And no, it's not going to be gone tomorrow. There has to be, you know, a path that we move, that we move on this that makes sense. And, I, you know, we sort of laid it out and we've had help. But I felt like, you know, we didn't know all the fancy words for it, but we were trying to, you know, find, trying to thread the needle and do the right thing. And I think that this puts a framework around it. And I hope it's something we can follow as yeah. we move forward. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Matt. Yeah. And, and if I might add, the Washington Street Project, I think, is a, is a good example of us trying to do this ahead of the curve. Um, and you know, and this could have been applied at Sheepon Road in that area um, to avoid bumping up against some of the things that delayed or, or took time that, that might have been anticipated with a process like this. So it's great. Yep, yeah. Um, so the next presentation was given by Courtney Rocha, who works for MVP. And she went through the 40 recommendations within the Coastal Resilience Plan to see which ones would she thought would be competitive for an MVP grant. Um, from that, she picked out three, um, but really two. So the first is the Community Outreach and Property Owner Resilience. The kind of second one together would be looking, she had recommended doing a strategic retreat and relocation program, but using the Surfside Wastewater facility as kind of a case study um, through the interdepartmental work group that we have uh, we we've talked about you know what are we going to apply for for this year and that group decided that we're, we're going to not go the coastal resilience route um, but more the sustainability route 
and apply for a downtown tree succession and urban afforestation planning project. So that would be, you know, uh, a plan for planting trees downtown and then also areas um, mid island for heat index and then just a succession um, plan because our trees downtown are getting older. So what are we going to do when um, those end up dying. Next. We had a discussion with Daniel Payton, who is the Waterways Program Chief at the Division of Wetlands and Waterways, uh, Mass DEP. And in 2022, Crack sent a letter to DEP regarding, regarding Chapter 91 licenses. So uh, for seawalls and revetments, property owners are required to maintain public access for fishing, fouling, and navigation. Um, but due to erosion and sea level rise, it can result in no fronting beach for public access. So CRAC re requested that applicants be in compliance with the existing license criteria in advance for, of going to the Conservation Commission for reconstruction permits. Um, so we talked about that a little bit. And then he gave an update about the proposed Chapter 91 and waterways regulation updates that are um, that now include planning for sea level rise and projects encouraging nature-based solutions, using resilient.ma.gov for best available data, and new coastal flood standards. So those proposed regulations are out now. I believe they're still in the comment period, um, and we'll see how those, how those go. Quick, a quick comment. It was very interesting, the first one on Chapter 91, because we've always been told there's nothing we can do that was approved that way we can't do that and he said well you've been told wrong and he showed us pictures of you know this is what they did in this place they made the homeowner put a stair over it they made him put a ladder they made sure that you had access along the shorefront and so I thought that that was uh, very good for us to hear very good for ComCom to hear we can require access it's part of the law so it's not like something we can't do it's something that we can do and we should do because it's required so i thought that was a very good thing to hear so. yeah thanks for including that matt i'll go to the next slide now so we had uh, sunny daly the executive director of the community foundation outline the goals and the application process for the offshore wind grant um, Crack expressed interest in submitting one of those grants, and we, you know, they put multiple recommendations forward. During the meeting, they decided to submit a grant for to translate the coastal resilience plan into Spanish, and then produce a video about coastal resilience on Nantucket. And um, I'm, I think we should be hearing back within the next couple months about that application. Next. Vince Murphy gave an update about the Harbor Sediment Transport Study. Um, this is for Nantucket, Pulpus, and Manicate Harbors to understand the sediment movement and address navigational needs. It was a priority recommendation in the CRP, and it will create a sediment transport model to help guide the decision making um, by ident identifying sediment resources, prioritizing erosion management locations, potential to create an island sand bank, and understand and protect sensitive habitats. So this um, is was eight months into the project. It should be finishing up in October 2024. There were questions regarding a need for a South Shore study, um, but this should really be undertaken in segments and tied directly to a specific coastal resilience project recommendation. The, Transport studies are really expensive, um, and the South Shore is so dynamic. So those those sandbars are shifting all of the time. Um, and so once we are starting to work or planning for a project on the South Shore, then that would be the appropriate time to have a transport study completed. Next. I gave a presentation about the Coastal Zone Management Grant that we received. We were awarded a little over $400,000. Um, the town is contributing about $110,000 to that. Um, so that is looking at Easy Street and addressing the flooding there. Um, it 
there's a lot of deliverables, but really the, the time frame for the grant is pretty quick for all of the stuff that we're going to get done. So this grant will finish up in June 2025. Um, so first, I actually just got it, the existing conditions and flood, flood risk report. Um, there'll be an alternatives development and pre-permitting feasibility assessment. So they'll be developing four alternatives for that area. And then through lots of community engagement and staff discussions, the community will choose one of those alternatives to move to 30% design. And uh, within that, we'll also get a cost estimation and timing for the project, permitting assessment, and a benefit cost analysis as well. Next slide. So that's all I have tonight. Um, Crack doesn't have any requests or recommendations, but of course, um, you know, we're open to if you guys have any rec requests that you would like Crack to look into, um, we can make that an agenda item. Crack meets the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. It's on Zoom, and the public is more than welcome to come and participate in that. So I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Housing Office request for letter of support to Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities seeking special local preference for Habitat for Humanities housing at 5, 7, and 9 Wade Drive. Hi, Christy Farantella. Um, so I'm requesting that the board approve a letter to be sent to the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities um, to support Habitat for Humanities request for local preference. This is at their development over on Waite Drive. And what this would do would, um, the first request for local preference is that 70% of their six units would be in a special lottery for people who either live or work or have children in the school systems here. Um, that's very typical when we're putting in these requests for the units to go on our shy list. Um, in addition, we are asking for a special municipal local preference. And so two of these units, two out of the six, would be reserved for a lottery for municipal employees. And this is something that we've requested at 31 Fairgrounds. Um, and uh, we've requested with the EOHLC for this development. Um, so it's still not approved by the executive office, but it's something that we've been pursuing and Habitat has supported. Any questions? Move Motion. approval. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That carries unanimously. Thank you. Town manager's report. Thank you. Um, so our first item is a monthly departmental report from the fire department. And just to explain, we're kicking off a monthly program of departmental reports from each of the town administration departments. And we're starting with the fire department. Several months ago, there was a request from the board to replace the quarterly budget reports with more departmental operational and project reports. So we've developed a program for that. And uh, the fire chief is our first um, presenter. And I would introduce him and to uh, review the report and to introduce the other person. All right. Thank you, Libby. Uh, good evening, everybody. Sure, that would be great. You can go to the next slide, please, Erica. So basically, I just want to go over um, sort of the broadly the, the, the mission and goals of the fire department, just explain how we're structured as an organization, um, talk about some things that we're trying to accomplish, uh, both in capital purchases, um, some expense increase reports that we've asked for, some projects that we're working on, um, and then different challenges and, and in addition to that opportunities that we have. And then uh, I'm happy to answer some questions. Or if you have questions as I'm talking, please feel free to just interrupt me. So the mission of the department is pretty um, standard. Um, it doesn't change much over the years. We, you know, we exist as a department um, to protect the citizens and the visitors of this island and their property. And we try and do this through providing a high level of fire safety education um, and prevention 
and also providing a response if there is an emergency, you know, whether it's a fire or uh, a call for emergency medical services um, or a mitigation of any type of disaster. Uh, so the 24 and 25 goals have, have stayed, it stayed the same since last fiscal year. Our big push has been to increase the number of advanced life support certified firefighters. Um, and we're trying to do that by, uh, we've incentivized, um, we've incentivized a program for firefighters to attend paramedic school. It's a pretty um, in-depth program to become a paramedic. It's about two years. It's a big commitment and it's just, it's, it's a difficult thing, but, but we're making good progress. We have four firefighters right now that are also certified as paramedics. Um, so that's one firefighter per shift. We have two, uh, two more firefighters that have completed the program. We're just waiting for them to test to get their national certification and then their state certification. And we, um, we have two firefighters that are presently in the program. Um, and then our new one of our two new deputy chiefs is already um, a paramedic. So we're making good progress, but um, it's definitely a, a time commitment. And, and so that's why it's gone from fiscal year to uh, 24 to 25. And I anticipate it'll be an ongoing goal uh, uh, as we move forward through the next couple of years. Um, so we're also, it, Along with that is a goal to increase safety and efficiency. So we're trying to bring more people to each shift, more firefighters, so that we can have more firefighters on duty and be able to respond to multiple calls at once. Um, there are certainly times when we're not as busy, but um, you know, in the fire service and, and in public safety in general, you never really know when you're gonna get calls. I'll just give you a quick example. It was pretty quiet for several hours overnight last night and then this morning we had four calls within an hour so you just don't know how it's gonna and it doesn't really matter we've done all the studies and i've been in this business for a while it's hard to predict a particular day of the week like i always thought maybe a friday or saturday night is your busiest time but when i've run the numbers um, several times over the last 20 years it could be a monday afternoon is your busiest time so again having having more people on duty just gives us um, the opportunity to be able to, to handle multiple emergencies. You can go ahead to the next slide, please. This is just an organizational chart of the department. I know it's, it's sort of hard to read, but at the top of it, it starts with the select board um, and the town manager um, and the assistant town managers, and then the fire chief, uh, two deputy fire chiefs that we've hired, um, two office administrators, and then there's two fire prevention officers. And then each shift has a captain. So there's four shifts. Each shift is supervised by a captain in charge. We're in the process of promoting four people to lieutenant. So each shift will have a captain and a lieutenant. And then there's um, currently five firefighters assigned to the shift. So it'll be seven. So right now it's seven people per shift. Um, you can see we have a couple of red circles up there. That just shows that we have one captain who recently retired, uh, we, we're in the process of filling that, that spot. And the lieutenant's position um, is something that's new to the department. Um, but again, it'll give us an increased level of safety and responsibility by trying to have an officer uh, uh, be able to respond to, to each call so that we have somebody who's um, trained a little bit more, has passed some rigorous examinations and, and can run an emergency um, to the best of our ability. So that's new, that's in the process of being completed. So that's why that one circled too. You can go ahead to the next slide, please. So overall, we have 32 line firefighters. Um, again, uh, we've, we've increased over the last year a firefighter per shift. The goal is, as you'll see when we get to the EIRs, I've put in to increase each shift by another firefighter to bring us up to nine firefighters per shift. It's the standard when we look at our um, our comparable departments on the Cape. Um, the, 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 I looked at eight different departments. The lowest number that I could find that was a comparable had 10 people per shift. The most had 14 per shift. And, those, and when I reached out to each one of those departments, it was interesting because each chief I spoke to said they were also asking for more staffing um, at that time. And, and I think it's just something to keep in mind is that um, 
on the mainland, they also rely heavily on mutual aid, which we just don't have that that opportunity, at least in a timely manner. Um, so, so we're making good progress. Um, as of March, um, when we made this uh, slide presentation, um, we were at zero vacancies. However, we do have one person leaving uh, May 1st, so we're in the process of filling that vacancy now. Um, we did hire two deputy chiefs. Uh, I'm accompanied tonight by Deputy Chief Tim Vamosi, who comes to us after working 20 years uh, for the Easton Fire Department in Massachusetts. Tim's a 20-year veteran of the department. Tim is a paramedic. Um, he's been in charge of the department's EMS, um, and he brings a lot of um, experience, expertise, and knowledge to the department. We're really excited to have him. So I wanted to just introduce him and uh, you know, welcome him to the department. We're excited that he's here. Uh, the welcome. other deputy chief is Nick Esposito. He's joining us. Nick is going to start on May 28th. He's coming to us from Bridgeport, Connecticut after serving uh, 25 years in Bridgeport. So he'll be starting there too. Again, he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience and education to us. So we're really excited about it. Um, we did a um, an extensive search. Uh, we did not have any internal applicants from the fire department that applied for the position. Um, so we were really happy to get such high quality people um, that did apply and, and, and we're excited that they're, they're either here or gonna be here soon. Um, again, I talked about the FY25 budget request for an additional four full-time firefighters and that'll bring our shift uh, strength up to nine firefighters per shift. So it'll be a captain, a lieutenant, and then seven firefighters on each shift. Can you go to the next slide, please, Erica? Overall, our FY24 budget is generally um, in line. We do have some um, expenses that are above what's um, been budgeted. So if you look at that, some of that is with the firefighters union settled a new collective bargaining agreement with the town in July. Um, so some of that overage um, has to do with that in salaries. Overtime is projected to be overspent. Some of that has to do with the fact that we've hired these firefighters. We've hired, I think in the last, since July, we've hired like nine firefighters, um, but it takes almost a full year for a firefighter to count towards staffing. We have to train them in our department policies and procedures. They have to be uh, trained and then tested on each piece of apparatus that we um, that we use in each piece of equipment, uh, both the ambulances and the fire apparatus. And they have to go away um, for a pretty intensive 10 week uh, fire academy training program. Uh, so by the time it's all said and done, um, it takes close to a year. And so for that reason, although they have started and we're making good progress, um, they don't count towards staffing. So we're still paying some overtime. Uh, promotions and Mike, new hires, there's just a cost. Uh, of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can, can I ask you to comment on the collective bargaining agreement um, and the new compensation levels and the impact on your ability to hire? Is that so? I, so um, the compensation has gone up substantially for a new hire. I think um, I think it's gone up between 10 and $20,000 for a new hire coming in the door. Um, and it's made a big difference. We've seen our applications go up from just one or two applications for a vacancy up to you know up to at least a dozen um, maybe i think the last group we had a, about a dozen applicants so i i call that a significant uh increase in our in our applicant pool and um it, you know it's important because we you know we need we need to attract people here um, i know obviously there's no secret to anybody we have a housing issue um, and we're working on that but making it attractive, if somebody looks at the salary and says, wow, that's, that's comparable to anywhere on the Cape, then I think they're more likely to apply. So again, we're going through the promotional process. Um, that, it just costs money to put on that process. Uh, we just recently promoted a captain. We had hired a, a, a company to, to come in and do uh, some, uh, to do like an assessment center. Um, that's how we made that. With the recent collective bargaining agreement, uh, we changed the promotional procedure. So we do a lot of it in-house now, but there still is a cost involved. We have to pay somebody to prepare a written exam and, and those types of things. So there's still a cost involved. And then the additional education is um, 
we're sending people to paramedic school. We, you know, we've incentivized that program uh, to try and make it more appealing for somebody to, to give up basically two years of their life for, for school. Uh, so, so again, there's a cost involved with that, but I think it's well worth um, the cost for the benefit that we're gonna receive as a community. We are working pretty closely with uh, the finance department to address the, the, the budget um, overrides and to transfer some, um, to make some budget transfers. So this is just a recap of what I've talked about with the EIRs, uh, the, the uh, expense increase request for four new firefighters, and then just the onboarding cost, cost associated with, with new hires. We have to send them off island for occupational uh, physicals that meet the NFPA requirements. We have to get them gear. We have to buy them uniforms, and we have to get them enrolled in, in the, uh, the State Fire Academy. As far as the public safety request, uh, I, this is we've talked about this with the articles coming up for town meeting. Um, we desperately need uh, a, an auxiliary public safety building. We have a ton of equipment. It's super expensive. We just ordered a new fire truck. That's just over a million dollars. Um, the thought of taking something like that and keeping it outside um, is just it just takes away the life expectancy. It's just not good. It's just not good practice. So, so this building will help alleviate some of those problems that we have with storing equipment. Um, and, and that's really, that's it for that. The rest of the vehicle purchases you see there are just part of our normal vehicle replacement. Um, we're replacing another engine that's just out of date. Um, it's, you know, we reached that point where it, it doesn't make sense to keep repairing vehicles that their life is, you know, they're at the end of their service life. We do, I will say, um, try and get the maximum life out of each piece of apparatus that we buy. When we when we purchase an ambulance, as a as an example, we try and keep that ambulance as our first run ambulance for a period of three or four years, depending on how much use it gets, and then we'll move that to our second line or our second run, so that goes out to the second call, so it gets used less frequently but we can keep that for another couple of years there. And then we can move it again to the third line and the fourth line. So we can try and get like 12 years out of an ambulance. And we try and do that with all of our apparatus so that we get the maximum service life, uh, service life out of it. Yeah. Yeah, one, one question I had was, there was issues with uh, getting things to the fire department. They're from off island, they come over, they work on the airport equipment, and then they come over to us and they work on our equipment. We've been doing this now for about, I would say six or eight months, and it's been a, a it's been a great a great sort of collaboration. That's a good victory. Yeah, yeah, we're we're excited about it. Yeah. We can go to the next one. Again, I just can't emphasize enough the fact that we need more paramedics, more advanced life support. So there is a there's a there's a level of EMT that is not quite a paramedic but it's still an advanced level of life support. It's called an advanced EMT. Um, so instead of just saying paramedic all the time, I do include that language of advanced life support. If we get somebody who says, maybe I can't do the two year program, but I can do this sort of in the middle program, we try and encourage them to do that. At least they can, they can still do a lot more than we can do as a basic level EMT. So um, we're focusing on the mental health part of, um, the department, you know, we as firefighters and, and everyone in public safety, you, you're just exposed to a lot of bad things that happen. Um, and so, you know, we've really made an effort and I think there's an effort nationwide in the fire service to really like sort of take care of ourselves and take care of each other. So we've been working pretty closely with um, different organizations. We work with Fairwinds pretty frequently. Um, we're in constant collaboration with the police department um, anytime we have some kind of call that is like a traumatic call for our responders, we bring people in from off island that are that also have a history in either police, fire, or dispatching, and are also clinicians, um, and they they're able to sort of sit with us and and just sort of help get through the the, the short term and and offer us resources for the long term. So I think it's really important for our long term um, sustainability in the service. Um, so that's one of our priorities. 
so after the veranda house fire, uh, the fire department received a, a very generous donation uh, from the veranda house to support our local fire prevention efforts. Um, so our fire prevention officers in conjunction with uh, a, a professional uh, production company put together some videos. Uh, so one video was made for the school department and basically it teaches the teachers and the and the workers in the schools how to safely respond to and what they should do in the event of a fire um, to both protect their children and 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 to help their coworkers. We've also developed the same types of videos for people who work in the service uh, hotel industry. So it's it's to tell uh, the employees when the new employee gets hired, either in the school department or in the nightclubs, bars, restaurants, or in the hotel industry, it's part of their onboarding process. They watch these videos and it explains to them what they should do if the fire alarm goes off, if there is a fire, if they see somebody doing something that's not safe. So I think these um, they've just finished in the last month and they, they're going to go out and be part of the, the onboarding for all of the uh, local organizations that bring employees on so I think that that's a great a great use of that funds and and I'm proud of our fire prevention officers for for putting it together. The crisis intervention stress management I talked about we're doing between the police and fire and Fairwinds and and I thank uh, Chief Casper and her team and Amanda Wright and her team at Fairwinds for for all the the time they spent taking care of our people. Challenges. So the challenges have been the budgetary impact of hiring all these people at the same time and, and the associated cost of getting them on the ferry and getting them over for physicals and buying their uniforms and getting them into the academy and all of those things. Um, but we're headed in, in a very good direction and I'm very excited about it. I think um, in a year from now, we're going to have uh, at least a couple people per shift more that actually count towards staffing. And I think as a department and as a community, we're just going to be in a much better place um, th than, than we are. Um, for an opportunity during fiscal year 25, I've been working very closely with uh, the Harbor Master's Office and Sheila Lucy, and uh, we've come up with a training program so that every one of our firefighters is going to be trained through the National Association of State Boating, uh, it's safe boating laws administrators are NASBLA, the boat operator search and rescue program. So the goal is we work with the Harbor Master's office already. If we have an emergency that happens out on the water, we either jump in the Harbor Master's boat, or we'll go down to Brant Point and jump in with the Coast Guard um, or meet them somewhere and respond to an emergency. This just cross trains us so that in the event we have an emergency going on somewhere, we can very quickly jump in either with the harbor master or if the harbor master is on one, excuse me, one side of the island and there's a boat down in Madiket, we could just jump on that boat and respond. So, you know, it's a great program. I'm excited about sending all of our people uh, through it. I just think it, it makes us all much more resilient and able to work together. That's actually, that's really great because there have been some questions that came up about the fire department having a boat but it seems this seems like a yeah so perfect I mean, we're, way to we're, we're making we, to know, have we, we work closely with what the we need master in place. And the police department already so i think this just sort of solidifies what we're already doing and and just you know like i said it, it just makes our working together that much more seamless so in summary you know we're striving to provide the best level level of service to to everyone who's on the island um my primary focus has been to increase our staffing levels to a point where we can handle multiple emergencies. Uh, in that respect, I think we're making significant progress. And I would just like to thank um, you as the select board and the town manager and the voters, um, everybody for, for the support that has been given to the fire department and, and helping us bring this goal and these, all of these goals to fruition. So thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. I've got, I've got a couple. Sure. There was a uh, discussion on PFAS and health testing. Has that, has the union talked to you? Has that, any of that conversation happened yet? We have conversation. We had a conversation about it as recently as today. Um, the, the, the conversation I had today with the union is that they're exploring 
some other options with um, directly with the hospital, um, and they were going to get back to me. That nice. was as of like two o'clock. Nice. The other one was there was a program to try and uh, re-energize volunteers. So if we do have a humongous fire again, there's some support. Maybe people just to move hoses or do the grunt work, hand out water. Has any of that? I know someone was working on that. No, that, that that has happened, and, I'm, and I right. appreciate you bringing that up because I should have included that in in my presentation. But we we have um, we have revitalized our call force. Uh, we've hired about 15 call firefighters in the last year. So um, these people have they've gone through all the same <clears throat> excuse me onboarding as far as being sent off island for the physicals to make sure they're safe and all that kind of stuff. We've ordered them gear. We, we don't obviously need to buy them uniforms, but they do need the protective gear. So we're working on that. But the, they come in once a month in at, I don't know, like a Wednesday night at six o'clock and they stay for two or three hours and we run a drill. So the shift that's on duty along with um, the deputy chief puts this drill on and, and they, it gives them an opportunity to work together and we've had several, I know I haven't been here for that long, but we've had a, a couple of pretty decent fires um, and we've had a good turnout of the call firefighters and they provide a tremendous amount of service to us. I know they can't go in the building and put out the fire, but after we're done doing that and you got to break down five inch hose that weighs a ton, you know, you got a, a group of, of call people right there ready to work and they're dedicated and they're not in it for the money and, and they're, a, they're a, a, a real asset to us and we appreciate them. So and lastly, I'd like to just say, um, I'd like to publicly thank the interim deputy chief, Kevin Ramos, who um, when our deputy chief resigned, um, you know, I had talked to a couple people about getting somebody in that role because it's just a busy department and we need somebody in that role like immediately. Uh, he, he immediately stepped up and, and he's done a great job of helping um, what made me think of it is the call force. He's really got behind that. He's also started like the, the career to school, uh, school to career, excuse me, uh, program and, and sort of brought that back to life too. So I would just like to publicly thank him for his service and, and helping us uh, sort of keep the ship afloat um, in the short term over the last couple of months. So thank you. Yep, go ahead, Tom. Thank you, thank you, Chief, for your presentation. That was very thorough. Uh, just a quick question or just a quick comment on to acknowledge the the multiple layers of complexity that you have to deal with when you take in a new hire an EMT and they have to go off island and they also have to live here and, and, and or if they're not from here, then they have to adapt to the island and the possible levels of isolation and just like the multiple layers that that you, you, you kind of have to wade through to um, you know, to, to have a, a stable workforce who, who are happy at their jobs and productive. Um, I, I would imagine that's, that's a lot of different, maybe different from the p previous place that you, that you came from. And, um, and it sounds like you've really acknowledged that. And uh, that's very evident in the summary here. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, the level of dedication that I've seen just within the fire department is unmatched and, and I feel privileged to be part of it. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's going to be really good having these departmental reports. Off to a good start. Thank you. Now well, we've set a bar, so thank you, Chief, and welcome, um, Deputy Chief. So moving on to the monthly town management report, I want to just start by um, noting that our communications office staff is here. Florencia Rulo is our communications manager. She is in the back with Haley Cook, our public outreach coordinator. They've been working on some informational videos. Um, do you think you could pull those up, Erica? Um, that are part of our outreach for town meeting. They've, they're doing several videos on various town meeting warrant articles. And we, I just wanted to, we wanna to try to show them before town meeting in the in the coming weeks so we're going to show you three of them tonight they're they're pretty quick article 12 proposes an investment of six million dollars for the purchase of 31 western avenue formerly known as the star of the sea youth hostel to convert it into housing for our seasonal employees in particular lifeguards 
The proposal also includes renovating additional structures on the site to provide year-round housing for other town employees. This initiative is part of the Select Board's strategic plan to address crucial housing-focused goals. The proposal calls for funding of $6 million, subject to a Proposition 2.5 debt exclusion vote under Question 2 on the election ballot. What does this mean for the average homeowner? For those with a property valued at approximately $2 million and eligible for a residential exemption, a yes vote at town meeting and town election will result in an annual tax bill increase of about $14.40 per year over the next 20 years. Article 15 the scope includes of article the removal 15 of debris from the, the beach and bluff area, from the beach and bluff area, erosion, and restoring dunes at Tom Nevers Park, former, Nevers Park, former, Navy, Nevers Park, Nevers former Nevers Navy base. These efforts are in line with the Select Board's strategic planning objectives, focusing on efficient and effective town operations. These efforts are in line with the Select Board strategic planning objectives, focusing on efficient and effective town operations and environmental leadership. The goal is to maintain our municipal infrastructure while also preparing for and mitigating coastal environmental challenges. The proposal calls for an investment of $2 million. Funding is subject to a Proposition 2.5 debt exclusion vote under Question 5 on the election ballot. What does this mean for the average homeowner? For those with a property valued at approximately $2 million and eligible for a residential exemption, a yes at town meeting and town election will result in an annual tax bill increase of about $4.80 per year over the next 20 years. This initiative demonstrates a commitment to enhancing our community's recreational facilities and ecological sustainability. I lost you guys for Article 17 seeks to secure funding for the reconstruction of the tennis courts at Jetty's Beach. This initiative aligns with the Select Board's strategic planning for a healthy and vibrant community by improving recreational space near one of the island's most popular beaches. The proposed appropriation is $1.9 million. Funding is subject to a Proposition 2.5 debt exclusion vote under Question 7 on the election ballot. What does this mean for the average homeowner? For those with a property valued at approximately $2 million and eligible for a residential exemption, a yes at town meeting and town election will result in an annual tax bill increase of about $4.56 per year over the next 20 years. This article aims to invest in the revitalization of a key community asset, ensuring that residents and visitors alike can continue to enjoy a high quality recreational facility for years to come. The reconstruction will also include pickleball courts. Thank you. Um, thank you guys, they, they, the videos look great. And we have some more to come. We'll post them on our social media accounts and get the information out before town meeting. We'll do a couple more uh, next week. Uh, okay, so. You know, the pickleball courts, they'll, to everything, everything will pass, Libby. Uh, well, yeah, you're, you're I, I could see Tom was lighting up. I know, he, he did light up about that, yes. Can't do anything without pickleball around here. Um, okay, so I just wanted to go over, um, I won't re read everything in the monthly report, but we obviously are working a lot on annual town meeting prep. There's a lot of communications going on right now, FinCom meetings, follow up, lots of assembling of items. I really want to thank Erica for getting the warrant put together. It's out in, at the printer and, and it'll get ready to get out and get mailed. We're doing the outreach on the debt exclusion articles. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time on our strategic plan, your strategic plan, following up on it. And as you all know, each of you is assigned to one of the focus areas of the plan, and staff is working with you on getting implementation plans ready and updates ready. We have one coming up at your meeting next week. I think it's transportation, and we're scheduling updates uh, throughout the rest of the year. We've got monthly town manager e-news that 
that we spent a lot of time getting ready every month. Fiscal 26, we're, we haven't even started fiscal 25 yet, and we're starting to prep for fiscal 26. Um, we've, we're trying to refresh our budget message and budget presentation to you, and it, it takes a lot of work. Um, also, capital prep is underway. We have a lot of projects going on, including the ones shown here, and th these are some of the ones that we're spending the most time on. Baxter Road, you've heard quite a bit about. Sheep Pond Road is continuing to move along. We have a lot of activity with Our Island Home. We're in the process of scheduling some outreach for abutters. Um, the, a, lot, a lot of our team today met with the Council on Aging. Um, so lots going on there. Long-term solid waste planning, had a meeting this week about that. The short-term registration program obviously is um, underway. PFOS is always happening and there's always something new. And I, th I think at some point in your near future, our near future, there may be a joint select board, board of health meeting uh, coming up on this. Uh, DPW facility, uh, well underway with that, and a lot of the other things that are shown here. The Surfside Area Roadway Project is um, pretty time consuming. Housing initiatives, of course, lots lots going on there, um, including a lot of work with municipal employee housing development potential and making sure we are keeping proper track of all of our growing inventory of town employee rental housing. That's housing that we own and rent and housing that we are renting for some of our employees. And we are continuing to work on our 246 Fairgrounds Road site plan for the board's review. A lot of staffing um, issues going on. We, as you know, we've hired our real estate specialist and rental property manager. The hiring for the health and human services director is underway. We've got our two deputy fire chiefs hired. The DEI director is undergoing a job description review and we're exploring some alternative opportunities with our town employee DEI committee and cabinet. And we're, we're thinking of uh, a couple of different options. We're, we're reading a lot about DEI directors across the state and country. Um, it's really a dynamic kind of a situation with them. Uh, project manager final interviews um, are occurring and we are really trying to work on a professional development plan uh, for town employees, di to supervisors, department heads, uh, other staff people that, that we can have um, specific professional development throughout the year. And we've got some opportunities coming up in May. I think uh, a lot of us have been doing Mass Municipal Association webinars. I think some of you have done them too. They're, they're about an hour every couple of weeks with really pertinent topics. So we're spending some time doing those. The Washington Street Coastal Resiliency Planning that was mentioned by the Coastal Resilience Coordinator earlier. We have a monthly meeting with the Land Bank on this project. I think we have a meeting tomorrow. A lot of real estate issues. You might have noticed that the town building is, you, you all, um, thank you, approved a contract months ago for window replacement and exterior repairs to the town building and it is it, some some work is starting to happen you'll you'll see that um, there's trucks and stuff happening around the building we have some policy updates that you have recently approved flags and public comment we're, we're still working on some others we're following up on scheduling joint meetings with all the boards listed there as a result of the meetings that you've had fairly recently with the planning commission the planning board and other agencies so we're, we're going to try to work on getting um, actually there was a good idea today which was as our focus areas are getting discussed by you every month every other month we are at the agenda meeting we talked about inviting the town agencies that would be pertinent to those focus areas so next week for example we have transportation so we're going to invite the planning commission and who else did we say I forget at fincom maybe because um, there might be some financial uh, implication at some time so we're, we're thinking we should invite those types of groups that might be associated in some way with the focus area so that we can make sure they're on the same page with it and they understand it and you get some input from them maybe so like that, B BPAC or uh yeah you know yeah you know, BPAC would be a good one for yeah. next week yeah yeah, yeah NRT uh yeah and then there's traffic safety. I'm just thinking of the groups that deal with it. So that's underway. Um, 
we've worked, we recently had some conflict of interest training for board committee and commission members. Uh, the finance director, myself, the assistant town manager for operations and uh, for administration and town council and uh, our wastewater consultant recently met with some Cape Cod Commission staff about the Cape Cod and Islands Water Protection Fund. We've talked about that on and off over the last couple of years. And we we came away from the meeting each having a little bit of homework. And so we're working on that homework now. We're developing these monthly reports for you and uh, uh, other items underway, lots of weekly and monthly meetings. And lastly, um, Matt, you asked not too long ago, and I think I might have mentioned this last week, for an update on, I, th I think what you were trying to get at was the, the projects that are all underway that are necessitating road closures, what is going on with them and when, when are roads going to be put back together. So we've got DPW director um, online, I think, and is the, and the sewer director to each um, and Erica as well is overseeing one of the projects they're each going to give you a little update of where we are with some of this and this will overlap a little bit with a much more comprehensive transportation projects meeting at your meeting next week so who who's going first here is this is this DPW this is DPW yep. okay. Drew thank you Libby um so yeah, we'll just uh, I'll walk you guys through the uh, improvements that we're planning to uh, undertake this spring. Um, first and foremost, um, the reconstruction of uh, the Sankety and Coffin intersection on Wisconsin. Um, in the fall, we had cleared the trees, done some drainage improvements, um, and the sewer department was able to do some sewer repairs. Um, so that will be reconstructed. Um, there is a note here that says it's scheduled for the week after Daffodil Festival. Um, with the weather and, and other changes in schedule, there's a chance that we may be able to start and complete that uh, before Daffodil, but we'll certainly um, coordinate the construction efforts around that uh, important festival out in Sconset. Um, as part of that, while in the area, um, the plan is to overlay Sankety Road um, from the intersection up to Bayberry Lane and overlay Coffin Street uh, over to uh, West Sankety Road. Um, Two other areas that we're planning to pave uh, this spring are Pulpus Road um, from roughly the Quidna intersection down to uh, 286 Pulpus Road, which is near uh, Almanac Pond Road. Um, and that extends some um, paving east from where uh, previous paving efforts were done in the last three or four years. Um, additionally, on Pulpus Road, um, right near the Life Saving Museum and Folgers Marsh, up to approximately 173 Pulpus Road, we're gonna do some overlay work. That is dependent upon uh, spot repair or lining of the Folgers Marsh uh, culvert, which is why it was skipped previously. Um, so there's a little bit of work to do there before we can uh, accomplish that. And then lastly, um, the plan is to uh, overlay Cliff Road from John Adams Way um, near uh, Pilgrim uh, to Crooked Lane. Um, again, in the last couple of years, uh, Cliff Road was repaved from Madiket uh, to Crooked, so we're extending some good, uh, you know, new pavement east, and uh, I expect in the next couple of years we'll uh, we'll extend that down uh, into town on, on Cliff Road. Um, we identified three areas for sidewalk improvements this spring to piggyback on the effort we uh, we were able to accomplish in the fall. Um, the first of which here is Federal Street from East Chestnut to Oak, so that's uh, in front of uh, Ventuno and Studio Nantucket. That was actually completed today. Um, and then the plan would be to start on Friday on Federal Street on the opposite side of the road from Chestnut to India, um, which is, in my opinion, one of the worst areas of, of the sidewalks downtown. So we're happy to be able to get on that uh, early here in the season, especially with businesses uh, still closed. Um, the last area uh, that we are planning to uh, do sidewalk improvements this spring uh, is Center Street at Broad, which is really the corner, uh, more or less uh, from uh, Languedoc, uh, up and around the corner to, uh, born and bred. Um, in addition to the easy street work that was accomplished, uh, back in January, we're planning to, uh, do some cobblestone improvements on East Chestnut and Oak street, uh, both of which are not the entire width of the roadway, uh, largely in the traveled ways, uh, where there's some major rutting. Um, and, uh, and then, there are a number of various spot repairs on Main Street. Um, too many to list here, but uh, both on, on Main Street proper and on uh, Upper Main. Um, and then lastly, there are some higher priority and lower priority spot repairs that we're hoping to accomplish. They're really just one two-day 
um, small projects that we're hoping to fit in the schedule. Um, <clears throat> I don't need to highlight all of them here, but uh, the one I do want to just touch upon is, is something we already completed uh, as soon as they were able to return from their winter hiatus which is the uh, installation of the curb ramps at the crosswalks on Orange Street uh, near Marine Home Center and Our Island Home. Um, that was an area that uh, the Commission on Disabilities identified as uh, uh, important uh, for accessibility uh, improvements. And uh, we were able to get uh, the contractor out there um, and get those accomplished. So um, that's all I have. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, otherwise I can pass it on to David Gray to talk about sewer projects. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't have the hands up. Um, Rick Atherton. Uh, Dawn, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Good. I just have one question about the uh, paving of the Pulpus Road. Uh, and by inference, the same thing applies to the Hummock Pond and the Madigan Road, I, I understood, you know, several years ago that we would add reflectors to any extension of the paving projects on those roads, and I don't know the status of that. I, I can't believe I'm the only person who finds them very helpful for safety reasons, especially during foggy times, and as we all know, alcohol is served at the end of each of those roads. So. I think they're important, an important addition, and I'd love to hear the status of that request. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks, thanks for the reminder. We actually I, I wanted to also mention that uh, we are going to be doing the island-wide uh, line striping uh, this spring as well. Um, so we recently uh, received bids for that, and uh, we're working to get that scheduled. As far as uh, the reflectors on Pulpus, I do know that, uh, that they uh, were installed on the very west end as you get close to Milestone. Uh, I don't know how far out they extend, but we can certainly entertain uh, getting those installed. That wouldn't be done by the same contractor uh, that does the uh, line striping, but uh, if uh, if we deem it helpful, we can certainly, uh, like I said, entertain that and, and make that happen. Yeah, one, one quick question. The, a yeah. couple that I had been asked about, I see uh, 43 Center Street here next to Ash Street, and there's a couple as you're driving into town on the left side, there's a couple of the sidewalks that have been tarred over that were, yeah. Oh, that's part of yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I will wait. Perfect. Go ahead, David. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, a lot to go over. Uh, I'll try to do it quickly here. Um, C street, um, we're going to be doing a leveling and overlay payment coming up, um, which is going to coordinate with the North uh, water street, Belgian block replacement. As we get into that area, that's all slated to be in the fall of 2024. So um, it may be ahead of schedule because they're talking about maybe doing some prep work coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, step lanes, another one that we're looking at, um, and we're looking at some of the uh, with the construction there, uh, how we can get in without disrupting what they're trying to do, and likewise they can disrupt what we're trying to do. So. Step lane has been quite a challenge. We were all up there on Tuesday. We did a whole complete wild site walk with Mass DEP as well to go over everything. Um, so those two areas are coming along. The uh, Center Street um, is slated to look, we're looking around fall again of 2024 to get into the major reconstructive stuff. Now this is gonna be all the sidewalks on Center Street, both sides. Um, the reason that we have done the the overlay and the pavement on everything is we want that everything to settle. And everyone that drives Center Street and these other streets, it, it's, ha it's held up very, very well. So that's gonna allow us to be able to go in, install the sidewalks back to where they were. Um, we're gonna fix a lot of the curbing along Center Street and along all the other roads that we've worked on to try to bring them, not raise them, over, but to try to bring them level again with each other instead of having the different sidewalk, uh, the curbing cocked here and there, up and down, sideways or whatever. So we're going to try to straighten a lot of that out. Um, we're also going to work very closely around the tree areas to try to mitigate all those trip hazards um, on the sidewalk, especially on the center street side that still has the bricks in place. Um, that's all going to take in. It's, it's going to be a very um, 
time-consuming project to get those all back to exactly the way they were, especially on uh, Lily Street, where it had some very, very old stone sidewalks in those areas. Um, when we took those all up, we actually categorized everything. We had numbers on the bricks, on the st stones, on the cobblestones. So that's going to be um, all back together here yeah, coming up. Um, what we're going to do coming up on Lily Street is where we started again this year. Um, they're going to, they're making the turn right now onto at Gardner Street and Liberty Street. They're going in far enough. They're going to stop for the year with all the infrastructure, and then they're going back to Lily to finish what uh, services and stuff that they have to do and prep it for paving. We will pay that just like we did the other end of uh, Lily Street, we'll, we'll temporary asphalt, all the sidewalks and the roadway. And then in the, the following year after that, we'll go in and completely do the sidewalks and, and everything. Um, it's just to allow for that settling, which uh, Lily Street is, Matt knows and other people know a lot of a lot of clay in those areas, and it's been pretty challenging um, to take and uh, mitigate some of the clay issues. Uh, Pleasant Street, uh, we're st still getting ready to make that final turn on to Silver Street before the end of the uh, construction season, and then they're going to go in and they're going to prep all the roadways for asphalt. Um, Atlantic Ave work right now is going on. They uh, we're making some more connections to some of the houses that when we did the, the new pro the gravity line and everything, we found some connections, some older connections from older houses that were, they were coming in too low. Um, and we actually had to go into a couple of homes and raise the services to come out to be able to cross over the water line, the storm water line and everything else. That was being taken place this week so that they can get in and prep that roadway for um, the binder coat. Uh, the drainage has been done and worked on. They were up there again today working on it. Um, so Atlantic Ave is one of the roads that we hope to get back online here before all the others. It's, uh, it's a main thoroughfare. Um, I know it's been a traffic headache, although people that live there want to keep it dirt all summer, but um, it's, it's been quite a project so far. Um, Surfside Road still is... Uh, uh, all the heavy duty work on Surfside Road has been completed. Um, we do have a joint project coming up with DPW and the transportation department for the multi-use path along the front of the school. There'll be uh, a little bit of a widening going on. The, the Belgian blocks that are there are going to be all removed. There's going to be curbing installed, but it's all being coordinated together with myself, Drew, and Mike Burns working with Erica and house moves and everything else like that so we can try to we don't want to go in and pave everything and then have to come back and rip it up and put curbing in so we're trying to coordinate everything together um, a lot of the Surfside Road area where, where we may have to do some some overlays in some areas because of all the trench work but we're trying to limit that it, it just we don't want to overlay stuff and then have to just grind it all up and throw the money away so we're trying to limit that. Um, so Surfside Road's ongoing. Um, South Shore Road is um, this plan. They're planning on doing some summer work on South Shore Road with some drainage. Um, they're planning on spending the summer at the facility, at the plant, doing all the, the vaults for the new valves for all the force main connections and the T's and the, all the additions and, and with the new force main coming into it. So that's all. Uh, ongoing as well for the summer. Um, we finished, uh, we have temporarily paved East Dover Street from the CMON program. That's just a temporary patch. That, that will not be permanent. That's gonna, we're gonna let that settle and then it'll be completely um, milled and overlaid and everything coming up within a year. Um, Car, uh, King Street in Sconset was fi finalized yesterday. The paving out there, the King Street and um, Shell Street in Sconset. Um, that's got all brand new sewer. We had to move the water, some storm water work, all the services to all the houses um, as part of the CMOM program. Um, the only thing that left that we have to do for the CMOM program this fall coming up will be uh, a section of Pleasant Street between uh, Back Street and Cherry Street. In that section, we have some very old six inch pipe there that's all going to be replaced. We could not do it this year because of we didn't want to conflict everything with RBO trying to go through five corners and trying to really give Erica a bigger headache with 
trying to block more of the road than we needed to. So we're going to work on that uh, in the fall. Um, the only other big thing I have on, on Pleasure Street coming up is we're going to be replacing a manhole that's collapsing at the corner of Candle House Lane and, and Pleasant Street coming up within the next few weeks. It's, uh, we've been crossing our fingers on, and it's once RBO is enough out of the way so we don't have to have the whole road blocked off, we're going to try to get in there and do that. So, um, But we've been working extremely closely with uh, Erica and town administration. We, we've walked the route three or four times now. We've walked it with Libby a couple of times to go over all the sidewalks. So it's, uh, it's been a very big project, challenging project, but we're getting there. It's, it's, it's been slow, but we're getting there. And then I know Erica had a couple more things though. Thanks. So if it wasn't answered, the paved portions of the brick sidewalk on Center Street, those will be converted back to brick. Right. So this is te it is just temporary. Right. Um, regarding the water main project that has been going on west of the airport that involves multiple roads, Monahansett, Orkawa, Lovers, Skyline Drive, Webster Road, and Nobody Are Way, um, Monahansett, Orkawa, and Lovers from Orkawa to the boulevard are all going to get a trench width pavement. Um, we're only doing a trench binding there because those roads, hopefully, will be all reconstructed with a new bike path as part of a separate project. Um, Lover's Lane, the unpaved portion, that will just have grading. It'll just restore to the, ro the road to the way it, it has been. Skyline Drive, that's going to be a full depth road reclamation and construction from Woodland Drive to, to Orkawa. That will match what has already happened on the other half of Skyline from the cul-de-sac um, closer to the airport down to Woodland Drive. Webster Road is going to get a mill and overlay pavement, as will Nobody Are Way. Um, I know that CC Construction, who's been doing the work, is actually going talking about bringing in a separate paving company to come in, because with all these projects, I'm sure everybody's probably wondering how it's all going to get done. Um, we have one paving contractor on Nantucket, and he is juggling all these projects along with the new airport project. So he has his marching orders, and we are going to do our best to get everything done. It might be a little later in the season potentially, but the idea is to have all this work done in time for the summer. Brock. Okay, I have one pet peeve. West Creek Road at Orange Street. There's a catch basin that's yeah. collapsing. Yes. It's all, it's on our list as is the one in front of Geronimo's. They, they did fill it, though. There was a big bump, and then they put some stuff in it a few days ago. Yeah, but it's a, it's a tough spot. Um, there's been so much going on that we haven't really been able to get in there and do it. Um, it's going to probably be, end up being some night work with one of our contractors. Um, the only other thing I, I did want to just mention that um, we're going to be performing a, a pressure and water test on the force main that's been installed here um, in the coming weeks all the way up to the turn onto Liberty Street at Gardner. So as of right now, the, the entire force main has been tested from C Street up until the middle of Lily Street, and we've tested the entire other end, completely pressure tested and water tested. So we're testing it in manageable sections as we go in case we run into any issues. So sometimes you're going to go down the road and you'll see a whip, a PVC, a poly pipe whip stepping out of the ground. That's what we have to use for testing to get the water in and the air pressure. So. Um, that's there's been one on Lily Street for about a year now. That's how we had to test the water main. So, um, yeah, one more comment I, on just the sidewalks. The sidewalks we did a couple years ago, probably three years ago, four years ago now. Most of them held held up pretty well. They are, and I know we made a harder base under there. Uh, the ones that are uh, driven on are starting to show a little wear. They're starting to wobble a little bit. You know, the edges are starting to go, so they aren't, you know, they aren't able to be driven on like before, you know, they're not, they're not coming apart in a, in a year or two, but are, they're starting to show it. Are these part of the sewer project or are these no, just in DPW general, work? So, yeah. like, are so there locations? The bring, I'm bringing it up. So when they're thinking about uh, how to redo Center Street, you know, I think the base there was pretty good. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think there's any reason to park at least on lower center street to be parking on the sidewalk even though people do 
and it should last. Is I'm just, but I'm saying yeah. it hasn't. It's just a general observation. I was driving around going, wow, those look brand new for a number of years, and they're just starting to look. The ones that get driven on are starting to not look brand. And new. that's one of the things that we're very detailed in, and all the reconstruction of the sidewalks is a base. Um, we we had been asked to be limited on some of the strengthening of the bases because they they wanted them to settle, but we can't install them that way. And the curbing and uh, you know it's like on Center Street. There's a there's a whole section that looks great. Curbing's all straight. Then there's two or three pieces. We're going to bring those all up to level. We're not going to reset every piece of curbing. We're going to try to bring everything. Um, and like I said, we've walked it with Libby a couple of times and everything like that. And we've we've located and identified the, the hazards and we're going to address those as we go along. So. Well, thank you for the update. That's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. And any other questions? Um, next up, we have select board reports and comments. For number one, I am going to join the audience as an interested citizen and hand it over to the vice chair. Thanks, Don. Um, no okay. laughing at us, Don. <laughs> okay. So I thought, um, John, Georgie, are you there? I'm planning to rely on you a lot in this upcoming segment. Um, I think I, I first wanted to um, comment briefly about the decision the board made not to appeal the ward case and really just to reemphasize what we stated in our um, press release, which is that as we looked at the potential outcomes of an appeal against what it might achieve relative to how to really solve this problem, which is um, sort of the direction the court sent us, which was to um, resolve this in our zoning bylaw. Um, and so I think uh, if the board, you know, concurs that that's really the direction we're encouraging the community to go, um, rather than following an appeal that that won't didn't look like it was going to solve the the issue for us as a community. So. Um, just wanted to say that up front and then to say that um, the reason this item is on the agenda is in part because of that decision, um, in part because um, our fellow board member Matt Fee asked um, for the opportunity to present a, a proposal that he's been working on with a group that includes um, Matt Haffenreffer and some others and, um, and then once this was on the agenda, of course, we got inquiries from other community members about would we entertain other proposals as well, and I felt um, pretty strongly that we should do that, that it not be limited, um, so that um, I do have, I think now, three um, things that have come. One came to me quite late. It's very brief that we can present um, toward the end, and Eric, I'm not sure you've seen that, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, great. So, um, John, I, we thought we'd start the meeting by talking a little bit about what our options are in terms of process, because we are now in the, in the closing weeks um, and the final days of preparing for annual town meeting, and I think we need to make it clear that the warrant is set it's um, gone to print, the process has basically closed for annual town meeting. And so there is, um, as far as I know, no opportunity to present any kind of significant amendments to the, to the proposals that are on the warrant, which are 59 and 60. Um, 59 is a zoning bylaw, 60 as a general bylaw revision um, that you might remember was a compromise among the three groups that had general bylaw proposals on the warrant um, that we consolidated those into, into 60. And then um, the citizen proponents of Article 59 had agreed that um, they would accept a motion not to adopt a 59 unless there were a court decision um, in the intervening time, and that is exactly what happened. And so that group has indicated that they plan, I, I believe 59 currently carries a 
basically a negative motion, a motion not to adopt. And I believe that the proponents of that article, Mr. Cohen is here, intend to call that article and, um, and ask town meeting to vote in favor. They're gonna present a positive motion and ask town meeting to, to vote in favor of that. So that's where we are in terms of the current um, yep, uh, annual town meeting. And I will, Mr. Giorgio has his hand up to correct or clarify what I may have misspoken. Go ahead, John, you need to unmute. John, you're muted. And unmuted myself. Um, the only, um, it's not really a correction, Brooke, it's just a, a point of information. And Mr. Cohen can certainly address this if he chooses. But um, he has circulated to me, um, and I'm not sure who else, some revisions that he would like to make to Article 59 at the annual town meeting. Um, and um, I've looked at those and I've consulted with the moderator. Um, and we are both in agreement that we do not think, uh, let me rephrase that, we think that the changes that we've seen in writing um, would probably be, would be within the scope of Article 59. This It's really more just clarification than anything else. I think if you look at the changes, however, um, there's quite a bit of red um, on the on the page, but when you read it, it really is um, just really clarification. So I just wanted to to uh, point that out, and I don't know whether Mr. Cohen, I don't know when it's when it's the right time to look at these point um, article by article. But I would just say, uh, Brooke, would you like to talk about sort of the options? I mean, I agree with you that. There's no opportunity to put any new articles or substantially amended articles on the um, annual town meeting warrant. So the question is, uh, if there are going to be any other proposals put forward, that would have to be in the context of a special town meeting, which the select board can call. Or if there's a petition filed with the signature of 200 voters, um, the select board would have to call a special town meeting within 45 days of receipt of that petition. Um, so we had looked at um, the possibility of putting a, calling a special town meeting within the annual um, town meeting. And that becomes difficult at this point in time um, because you know, um, there are certain charter requirements and practices and procedures in Nantucket um, for the run-up to a town meeting. And I know the town manager has put together a potential um, schedule for doing that, but I think it's going to be exceedingly difficult um, to do everything we need to do within within time for a special within the annual I don't think it's impossible, but I think we'd have to cut some corners, um, abbreviate some reviews, and I'm not sure that that, it certainly would deviate from your traditional procedures. Um, so that leaves the option of calling a special town meeting um, if that's the desire of the board. Um, and that could be done for some time in June. Um, I think there would be sufficient time to meet all the procedures and do that. Um, I assume the board would not want to call a special town meeting in July or August. I'm making that assumption um, so that the other option would be a September town meeting um, or, a, you know, a town meeting scheduled for um, to de deal with the other um, business that has already been talked about uh, needing a special town meeting in the fall. I would not recommend, however, that you go um, too long in terms of calling a special town meeting if you have concrete zoning proposals that uh, the board think merit consideration. Um, just because of the interplay between that and, um, and the uh, remand hearing that the zoning board of appeals is going to have to start, and the potent uh, in the in the um, 
a ward case and the potential for other requests for zoning enforcement that may or may not be coming in. I, I don't know of any, but that certainly would be a possibility. Um, so those are those are the considerations um, that I wanted everyone to think about. Um, I do have some comments on all four of the proposals that I think are out there, including Mr. Cohen's. Um, but I, I think you wanted to talk about process first. I did, and um, I want. I see that um, the planning director's hand is up. Leslie, did you want to talk about process since we're, that's the topic we're on for the moment? Uh, I, I think this falls under process, yes. Oh, am I frozen? Um, so I just wanted to point out um, relative to Article 59 for the annual town meeting, I believe the planning board is going to schedule a special public hearing for April 29th to talk about Mr. Cohen's um, changes to the article and to consider those. Uh, you may recall that they had originally supported Article 59. They changed their motion um, because the proponent requested that. Um, now they want to reconsider that. So I just want the select board to be aware that that is probably going to happen at a public hearing on the 29th of April. Um, the other thing is, you know, the, the planning board's been very involved in the short-term rental um, situation with the articles. And I know that they would like to have ample opportunity to consider anything that the select board wants to bring forward. And um, as John already said, the special within the annual has some time constraints and it certainly has some time constraints relative to the planning board's review and review from the public as well. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, so uh, we are at this moment and, and John, I'm afraid I'm gonna put you on the spot a little um, in that a lot of the concern that I'm hearing from the community is the, the impact of the, the ward decision on short-term rentals this summer and i know and and the and this feeling that we need to act immediately because the summer short-term rentals are somehow in peril and i'm wondering if you could help explain what we think the impact is um obviously it's a, a case by case basis but sort of a, a description of the decision and um is that a fair question at this point for you? Yes, yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, obviously, the ward decision involved a particular piece of property in a particular zoning district, and um, the the determination that Judge Vey made was that. Um, short-term rentals are not allowed as a primary use but he left um uh, he he did determine that it is possible that a short-term rental could meet the accessory use definition within the existing bylaw and that's why he remanded that back to the zoning board of appeals to hold a hearing um, the Zoning Board of Appeals, as I understand it, is preparing to schedule that first hearing. It has to be within 45 days of the decision. Um, and they are, I believe, intending to have what I'll call a fulsome discussion of the specifics as to the operation of that property and whether it meets the accessory use definition that exists in the bylaw today. That's not going to happen in one hearing. I doubt that very seriously. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a busy board. They have lots of other things with statutory deadlines that they have to meet. So I would anticipate um, this cannot be the sole focus of the Zoning Board of Appeals. They have other important <laughs> business that mandate hearings and a decision within particular timeframes. So um, I think once the ZBA holds that hearing and issues a decision, um, I have reason to believe, based upon communications that I've received, that the um, um, 
the wards would likely challenge any determination by the ZBA that in that particular case, that is the operation of the grape property for um, uh, as a short-term rental, cannot uh, meet the accessory use definition. Um, and I assume that that's the position their counsel is going to take in the remand hearing. Um, but that's not to say the grape situation is the same for everybody. And there is certainly no, um, as I said, no other request for zoning enforcement that's outstanding. Um, I don't, I, I, there's been no further activity in the uh, ward case. Uh, and I cannot give people legal advice in terms of their own personal private situation. But I would say that uh, unless and until um, there is a request for zoning enforcement against a particular property, and certainly until the ZBA renders their ruling, um, there's no, um, people have to make their own decision, but I don't see a legal bar to continuing to operate their short-term rental as they have in the past. But they need to seek private legal uh, advice of pr private counsel to make that determination. I cannot provide that to them. Okay, thank you. Um, while I we hope that's marginally clarifying for the community, it is, it is the situation we're in where the legal... Um, landscape is uncertain and unclear. Um, and I think uh, that is um, helpful in, in as much as it can be. So, Matt? Yeah, I brought this, I brought this to it, the board's attention two, three weeks ago. And my concern was that we were going to go to town meeting with one option, one option from the you know, rather extreme end of this. And I'm worried that we will not, you know, we will not as a community uh, support that again, even with the threats of, you know, the end of the world. I don't know that the community is going to get a two-thirds vote on 59. I'm very disappointed to think that we are, uh, you know, that we won't call a town meeting within the town meeting. I, I think that that would be, give us an opportunity to do that. And so, you know, and I, and I think 59 could go first in the town meeting, and if it passes in the town meeting, then, you know, these other articles for the special, you know, can go second. But I think it's, it's something, you know, I think based on where we are now, I think we have that responsibility to the community. Okay. And that's why, you know, so I hope that we find a way to do that. Okay. So, um, thanks, Matt. Um, so, just for the public's information, I'm not going to take any public comment because I'm going to go... Um, sort of after this preliminary explanation of potential process, that was sort of step one of tonight's meeting in this agenda. I think step two is going to be to ask the, the folks who have put forth alternative proposals. I've um, told them they have six minutes each to um, present their ideas to uh, the community and to this board. And I think out of that, then we can have a discussion about if, how, when we want to move forward with um, presenting any of these options um, and by what method and what timing to the community or, and to town meeting. So um, I'm going to um, I, I, I'm just trying to think how I should order this. Um, the, the first submission came from um, the group that Matt, just a, a clarification. I'm not. Are we basing whether we want to go forward, whether we like these articles the first time we've heard them, and you know, sort of, or are are we in general feeling though there's is that like I look at it generally, I'm not even sure what the third article is. I have an idea of. I know what Matt's is. I have an idea of the other one. I don't know what the third is, but I still think that the town meeting deserves a choices, and so I you know and I don't really need to even hear these. I. We can do that, but you know, I, my mind's made up, and I'm just asking my fellow board members: Would they like to have town meeting to have a choice? Because if we don't, then we don't. Why even have the hearing if we're going to vote no? Or do you guys need to hear it to decide? 
Okay, so let me ask um, the other two board members how they feel about this. Would you like to hear what is possible for such a meeting within the meeting or shortly whenever it gets scheduled or um, is, is the process part of this adequate to make a decision, yay or nay, um, at this time? Well, I can speak, <clears throat> Madam Chair. I sort of uh, <clears throat> agree a great deal with Matt. Uh, I think I haven't been convinced we should not have a special town meeting. And of the proposals, I haven't read them in great detail. One was very short, one was essentially an outline. Are we going to vote on including them or vote on whether we like one or the other tonight or what is our pro I need my process explained tonight. Okay, so, so this is one of the many things we, we need to discuss tonight because the timeline is short. So um, uh, I wasn't, I'm not really sure, frankly, there's so many elements to this that I wasn't really 100% sure how this was gonna proceed. So Tom, do you have any thoughts on the, this process question first? I guess it, so it sounds like a pretty tight time frame. And since our process is to have the requisite other boards weigh in on their process, process uh, or, or consider what the articles are, that that should be first and foremost, if possible. Um, so I think we should hear the, those who have submitted something that was in our packet for discussion and hear how far along, have the public hear how far along they are uh, and what they've worked on and what they've talked about and considered within the time frame that you laid out, Madam Chair, and then kind of come back to the process and see whether it's a special town, if, if possible, it's a special town meeting within town meeting or it's a special town meeting like, like, like John alluded to before, town council alluded to before, whether it's a separate special town meeting that that would be separate. So, um, you know, this started because um, Matt, you had said you were working on a, a, a proposal and um, and then when we heard from other groups that they also had alternate proposals, th then the question becomes if we if we opt to schedule a special town meeting within town meeting, then are we opening it up to other proposals, um, that's more of a question. W w what are your thoughts on that, first of all? And then um, uh, I'll leave that question on the table. Anyone have thoughts on that? I've kind of got a crazy thought. What? It, it, but part of this is the is the tightness of it. What if what if we asked? Mr. Cohen to table his and put these together a month later. Is that something that, you know, put put these together in one town meeting? Is that something that would be considered or? No. All right. So, yeah. so that, I didn't think it would, but I just yeah. want to give you the chance. <laughs> no, so so that so there's the, the sticking point we're in. So mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, well, you know, so. Yeah. Um, Malcolm. Well, Madam Chair, I mean, the comment about, yes, it would be nice for other boards and so forth to get input, but ultimately it's the uh, voters of the town that's going to decide. So I think we need a town meeting. We need this resolved as quickly as possible. And okay. I'm sure that uh, Article 59, uh, I, well, I'm not going to predict its outcome, but depending on that outcome, we may have nothing. Okay. Tom, any thoughts? Okay. So, John. Um, yes. Um, I'm going to ask. I'm, I'm going to. Oh. Can I ask you a specific question about our requirements? To um, what we are required to do if we call a special within town meeting. Uh, what is practice and what is uh, what is what would he obliged to do um i'll start there um, thank you erica you want to i'm going to have erica share the timeline john so you can sure thank you please erica as as erica is putting that up um one of the 
one of the things that will sort of inform whether there is an adequate time for the voters to consider a special within the annual is what is being proposed. Um, now, for there are a couple of these that are very simple and straightforward. Um, there is one that is an outline of a proposed warrant article. So the first thing that happens, if you if you look at Wednesday, April 3rd on the timeline, would be the board would tonight adopt a warrant with any comments. Well, you need a warrant article to put to vote to put on the warrant. And one of these proposals, as I said, the outline is not in warrant format. Okay, so that's the first problem. Um, if the board wants to pursue that one, then um, we would have to sit down and and draft out, draft up an actual zoning bylaw that would accomplish the goals contained there. And that's certainly not going to happen tonight. Um, the legal requirement is as soon as the board um, um calls for an, an, a, a special town meeting, you have to refer the zoning articles to the planning board. Um, also, the finance committee has to hold a public hearing um, on, on um, all articles, although they would typically just, um, I believe, and I'll defer to Denise on this, but if it's a zoning article, they typically defer to the planning board recommendation. Um, the warrant would have to be published in the in the newspaper. There'd have to be a pub, uh, both a finance committee and a planning board hearing. Um, and Leslie has uh, uh, Leslie, I'm not sure has your notice gone out for your public hearing, and would you have enough time to amend that notice to include other potential warrant articles that are special within the annual? For April 29th, the notice would be published in the INM the 11th and the 18th. So we would have to have an article by this Friday. So okay. it sounds like probably not realistic. Um, I think it might be realistic for one of these zoning amendments. I'm not sure if, if you've seen it, but it is in... Um, it is in the form of an actual amendment to the zoning bylaw. Um, so I think that's going to be the driving. Um, that might be the determination here is if the board were to call a special town meeting, we'd have to have an, a warrant article um, by Friday, which would, I think, necessitate another meeting of the select board um, to you know adopt that wording and make the required vote to refer it to the planning board. Okay, thank you. Um, Denise? Yeah, so I was, that was actually going to be my question through you, Madam Chair, to John Giorgio, that uh, how is, is it possible to call it STM without actually having warrant articles? That's my first comment or question. Secondly, you know, let's talk about the process. I mean, we spend, weeks and months, people get prepared in November, it closes then, we go through the process. And now I, I'm personally uncomfortable that it's one thing for the select board to potentially get a Warren article in because you're the policy makers, you're the governing body of Nantucket. But to have then three citizen articles being added at this last minute I I understand it's probably legal. I don't know that it makes it right. So that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've been talking through this timeline for a week now and trying to figure out, you know, w whether it is even, le you know, legally possible to, um, make a, 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 a special in within annual town meeting um, happen. So there is, there is what is 
humanly feasible. Um, there, and then there's the question of um, what does, in my mind, what does uh, fast tracking this process signal um, about the process of town meeting? And it's just a, a question that's in my head that I, that I want us to think about. Um, and so, so as to the question of hearing the content and having presentations of the content, for me, I think I need to hear it to help me evaluate what kind of compromises I'm willing to make um, in terms of the what should we do before we make a decision, is, is, if that helps you all understand. Yeah, Madam Chair, I, I agree. One, one of the downsides of short-term rental policy is that it's very complicated and, and some, of the, some of the provisions in these articles are going to be complicated and are gonna take some time for folks to digest. And so I, Denise is, the uh, chair of FinCom is right on that there's kind of a, there's, there has to be some sort of balance struck there. So if the rest of the board is uh, willing to um, hear the proposals, I, uh, I would suggest that we move forward with that and see how it goes. Yeah, Madam Chair, I have no problem. I think just in fairness, we should hear that. Yeah, okay. All right, terrific. So the, the first one that was submitted to us was um, the, the group that Matt Fee's been working on with Matt Haffenreffer. So Matt, if you want to come to the mic and, um, and just for, as a point of process, I, I started to say I have asked them to keep their presentations within six minutes so that we're not here all night. Um, and have each of them do so. And I think, Stephen, if you want to get up and talk about the amendments you're proposing to Article 59 so that the, so we have a word from everybody who is proposing to, to present a zoning or, or short-term rental articles to the community. So um, I'm going to have my cohort here um, set the timer for six minutes. And go ahead, Matt. Thank you. Um, so. Sure, how about there? So, hello and thank you for the chance to speak. My name is Matt Haffenreffer, and for transparency last year, my company provided the consulting services to the short-term rental work group for data. Um, tonight I'm speaking in my private capacity as a community member. So I wanna start with an analogy that I think helps describe the decision that we're talking about. There's a sign at your mechanic shop and it says fast, cheap, and good, please pick two. And ultimately, the point is that all decisions have trade-offs. Um, I think it's important that we acknowledge and carefully consider the trade-offs that we're making. Otherwise, those trade-offs are made are decided for us. Um, like the work group, we must find a balance that achieves a broad range of goals, even if it doesn't make the two extreme perspectives happy. To be clear, there's short-term rental should be a legal primary use everywhere, and there's short-term rental should not be legal and should not be allowed as a primary use anywhere. Those two views. Um, currently, we have two polarizing options or paths forward, and only one side can be satisfied if we pick one of those. I'm suggesting an alternative to be available at town meeting so we aren't choosing between one extreme or another. What I'm going to share, I hope, provides a middle ground. It asks all of us to compromise, not on our beliefs, but to make shared sacrifice so we can find a balance that the community can embrace. I'd like to take a few moments to state the basics of what this means to the individuals listening, and then to give a high level summary of the policy. After that, I'd like to give the opportunity for you to ask questions. So first, and at a high level, what this would mean is that anyone who has been short-term renting can keep short-term renting, whether a year-round resident or a seasonal resident. Next, any natural person may start to accessory short-term rent in the future. And there's two different versions that would meet that need for accessory. One, if your accessory rental is your primary residence, there would be no limit to the number of days, whether that be in your home while you are away or in a secondary dwelling unit, such as a cottage, whether you are home or away, or if you're gone, both when you're away. Those would be limited by the definition of primary residence. The second accessory definition would be 
31 days or less total. Then where we draw a line would be to limit the number of new commercial STRs. In other words, limit the number that could newly become full-time rentals. What this seeks to accomplish is not to force any immediate change, protect, protect tradition, protect neighborhoods, and to slowly work towards finding the balance that we're looking for. So I'm gonna get into some more of the details, um, slightly more technical, but not the full details because there's a lot of nuanced situations that I know people have questions about. Yeah, please. Sorry, should I have this up? I mean, are you, are you reading, reviewing this or you're just doing I'm just reading thing? commentary and then I figured the questions would be on the line item details, All right, I'm but just I'm gonna, explaining that at a higher level first. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So at a higher level, or sorry, slightly more technical, uh, and if I take it too far, reel me in, but I'm gonna speak at a simplified version and then you can ask questions or poke on the details. So first, this would be a pair of bylaws, general and zoning. And of all the proposals, this would take away the least from current short-term rentals. It defines ownership requirements in line with the short-term rental working group's goals. Plus it would grant a 10-year legacy window for non-compliant use. It defines accessory use two ways and allows an unlimited number of them. For the primary residents, it would be simple, enforceable, and unrestricted. And for non-primary residents, it would allow accessory use, but with a limit on the number of days that does not encourage investment into new short-term rentals as commercial short-term rentals. It would also define primary use as an unlimited number of days per year. And it would allow for legacy primary use for anyone with a registration at the state level when the, uh, at the time of passage. And after that, we would set a cap. It lets you to continue that use that you have as a primary use until you sell, stop short-term renting, or become otherwise non-compliant with the bylaws. It would also avoid creating a statutory grandfathering through zoning, which would allow us to con keep control of our decisions in the future. So that, that speaks to the, the purpose and how it would apply to different situations. Um, the details of the package itself are in there and more specific, but I think it's important for me to stop there because you guys might want to ask specific questions. Um, you made it in under five minutes. So awesome. um, thank you. Um, does the board have any questions for Matt? We'll do. Uh, Malcolm? Uh, we're working our way there. How is this though significantly different from the working group's proposal? Sure, so. Because there's some similarities, it's just kind of the same theme. Yeah, so there's, there's a few important differences. So one, we've simplified a few aspects of it. We've removed peak season. So from a town governance and compliance point of view, there's fewer aspects to manage. Um, We've also addressed that accessory definition for non-primary residents as 31 days, which the short-term rental work group intended to use that four-week peak season definition to limit new investments. And because of the, the numbers that show broader seasons and a significant season, that wouldn't be as limiting as I think they were intending. So I've made it more clear and simple. Um, but it also creates that room for primary residences to have un unlimited use, which benefits the goal in a legal way around um, supporting community and, and bringing in money for year-round community members, as well as creating an abundance of uh, short-term rental stock for our peaks, but within our current housing. Um, it also addresses the need for certainty around primary zoning, making it a legal use, but without the secondary concern for, that other people should have, which is that it would become statutorily protected. So those are just a few of the main main differences. So there's a handful more, but uh, it also eliminates some of the nuanced issues that would need uh, to be addressed more specifically on an individual basis. I just one more follow up. Sure. <clears throat> Could you just go a little deeper into non residents essentially running it as a business? I mean, you're so you're allowing businesses to run in uh, neighborhoods. Can in you restate your question? Neighborhoods, right? So if I, if I own a property and it's just a short, I'm just using it as a, I'm not living there. Let's go into that detail again. What happens to that person in that, that property? Sure, so, you know, what I'm, 
I think in the way that you've set up that question, there's a little bit of a judgment that it's not allowable or that we haven't done it historically. And what I'm suggesting is the compromise between they shouldn't be legal and we have them and they should be legal is to acknowledge the ones we have, not protect them in perpetuity, but also to um, allow the ones we have because we do, they have an important uh, part in our economy and the seasonal visitors that we bring in but they also impact. So we're, we're limiting the ones that would be like that in the future, trying to not add more, but we're acknowledging the ones that exist and giving them a, um, an opportunity to continue as long as they're in compliance. Um, I just, a little more, sorry, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, please. Sure. So you're limiting, you're limiting them in the future, uh, but not totally eliminating them in the future. And who knows what, life will be like in Nantucket in 10 years. That's correct. Um, yeah, so I, I, the, the goal of the way that it's written is to s s limit the growth of new full-time commercial STRs by setting a cap. So we let in people who have currently been doing it or historically been doing it, and then limit new ones unless we fall below a cap, which would be lower than the number we'd expect to sign up right out of the gate. Um, so, so I think the answer to your question is yes, um, but uh, I, I can be more specific. But I think the I think the answer is is yes. If I might ask a question, is there a, a provision that uh, on sale or turnover of the property, the license is relinquished? Correct. That's right. That's yeah. right. So there'd be um, the license that is granted um, would be good until a sale, and we would define that as not through inheritance uh, or reorganization, um, or until it stopped being used. The, the suggested period was two years of inactivity. And of course, you create a path for people to say, well, I've just gone through a death in the family, or there's some reason I suddenly couldn't. I think we always want to create an allowance for people to appeal those unique situations. But as long as the house is being used, we'd let them keep it in perpetuity. But yeah, two years of inactivity, or non-compliance, whether it be through ownership, like they're a corporation or they own more than two or two or more, so they would fall out of that tenure legacy eventually, and then they couldn't continue to rent those non-compliant, uh, or for other violations, like if they got, I don't know, however many repeated noise complaints you set as the limit. Okay, Tom? Matt, would you please comment on how you arrived or your the, the thinking process from the group on the cap on registrations for primary use? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the purpose of the cap, and also first letting people in, protects the decisions we've made up until now with the not best knowledge that we had. But the other perspective to this, you know, we can either have no limits on growth or we set limits on growth. Those are really our only two paths. Um, but if we're balancing the two, the goal is to set a limit that keeps a floor. We'll never have lower than that cap unless there's no market demand. But having a cap that's below the current starting point would allow us to slowly drop rentals off out of that primary use as they sell or as they become non-compliant, but giving us a long chance to understand how that changes the economy or what needs we have. Um, the number 618, which I set equal to the Shilas or the subsidized housing inventory, um, it fits in the range between the numbers that we'd expect on the high end and the numbers that we probably need on the low end. It's right in the middle, uh, or it's somewhere in the middle, and it's uh, a number that also makes a statement. The reason we're talking about this from two perspectives and two sides is because we have a housing need on this island that we're struggling with. And so to acknowledge that homes that are intended for commercial use as rentals um, should be considered as part of our total housing stock, just like we consider um, affordable housing. And so putting it in the middle and tying it to this shy list um, acknowledges that there is a correlation, but I set it up very intentionally with a, a proportional relationship. It's not equal to, it's equal to a ratio of the two that I suggested initially as one to one. And if you guys learn that we need more or less, it gives you a clear spot where you should adjust that. Okay, any other questions? Um, Madam Chair? Yes, John. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, I um, I want to, first I wanted to answer a question that Denise asked, but I didn't have an opportunity to answer. 
And that is whether you need the actual wording of the warrant article in order to call the meeting. Um, I don't think you do, but to refer it to the planning board for the public hearing, I think you would have to have the wording because the planning board would need a specific proposal to consider at the public hearing. So based upon the schedule, if we're going to do a special within the annual, I think by Friday we would have to have the wording to, to so that we could refer that to the planning board in time to meet their schedule. Secondly, with respect to um, Matt's specific proposal, I don't mean to throw cold water on this, but there's one glaring provision that I had not seen before, and that is that if 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 it is the owner's primary residence, they get special treatment. And that we discussed this at length with the short-term rental work group. And I provided a federal court opinion from the city of New Orleans, which have, has been adopted by several other circuits now, that says if you provide special permit in the uh, special um, provisions in the context of a short-term rental ordinance or bylaw that favors primary residences, that is a violation of the Commerce Clause to the United States Constitution. So while there's a lot in Matt's proposal that is commendable, um, I would not recommend you key it to primary residence because I think you will, you know, there's a good chance that um, the attorney general wouldn't approve it. Um, and and it, it would also um, subject you to further legal challenge. So I think we need to find another way to deal with this concept other than giving primary residences special treatment. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think that's, John, I think there's a misunderstanding. I don't believe that's what he's trying to do. I think he was very careful to be treating uh, equal people equally, but I, you know, I'll let Matt answer that. Yeah, so I, I think that the issue before is we were talking about local, changing the allowability of being local. Um, primary residences in different zoning articles seem to have different permissions. Um, other other towns have adopted those articles, um, and there's other ways to do it. If the terminology primary residence is the issue, there's other ways to define a similar intent. Um, we have them in different parts of our zoning code. We have different, yeah, we, we use those differences um, in other situations. You can also get rid of that, but it, it does play an important role in, I think, aligning it with the goals of the community. Um, okay, so rather than have a, a, a debate of the legality of what's being proposed um, in the moment, um, I think um, um, unless the board has any other questions, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take. There's a couple hands up from. Actually, I'm gonna hold for public questions. Um, Matt, can I have one? Sure. I think. There are a few of those that have been listed in other places, and so I'd look at if this is an important thing for you guys to decide on. Looking at towns that have used primary use to, uh, primary residence definitions, homestead as well as owner occupancy. There's a handful of different things that grant um, grant differences that you can look at to see. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna uh, move on. Charity Benz, do you want to come up and? Yeah, can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Because I'm getting asked. Before you talked about not having allowing public comment, was that just at that moment, or is it for this? Whole oh no, just item? just for now. I'm going to hold okay. public comment to after the presentations. Or I'm Thank going to you. do each of the presentations with questions from the board and town council, and then we'll open for public comment when all when when they're all on the table. Thank you for already. clarifying. Sure. Good evening. Um, my name is Charity Benz. Before I start, I would ask you all to check your emails. 
I have sent you a correction for the language in number one, yours is Comcast.net, uh, Malcolm. Um, did, Charity, did you send it to Erica? I did, I copied Erica. Okay. I just don't, I don't have email here at the meeting, oh, so okay. I can't pull it up. Okay. Um, and I will read it. Uh, if you want, to, if Erica, are you gonna put that up, the article? Is our error, I sent the wrong draft. Okay. But it's a minor change, there we go. Number one, and we can correct this immediately and have it to you by midnight if that's necessary, should read. The number of short-term rental use days permitted is the lesser of 56 days or the number of days the dwelling is occupied by the owner less one day. For the purposes of this article, long-term rentals of 31 consecutive days or more without sublet shall be considered as occupied by the owner. Would you like me to read that again? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. The number of short-term rental use days permitted is the lesser of 56 days or the number of days the dwelling is occupied by the owner less one day. For the purposes of this article, and this is something important and differentiates it from Article 60 from last year, long-term rentals of 31 consecutive days or more without sublet shall be considered as occupied by the owner. Okay, now I can explain that now or I can explain it a little later. Why don't you take... Let me give my spiel here, okay? Yeah. So, Tom, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to allow her to start again Sorry. just because of that clarification. So, six minutes. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to discuss the short-term rental article uh, we sent you yesterday, which clearly was wrong. Uh, for discussion tonight. It is concise, understandable, and purposeful. We are a growing group of residents who have come together prepared to file a petition for a special tone meeting with the article you have in your packets that will be amended uh, and which appears on the screen, which will be amended. We think that it is pro-zoning, pro-non-commercialized residential neighborhoods, pro-local housing, and one that is consistent with the recent ruling by Judge Bay, which codifies the right of homeowners to rent in the Nantucket tradition. This group has a name, put Nantucket neighborhoods first, and many voters will be getting a longer explanation of our mission and goals in the mail in a few days. In the past, STR articles have failed because they would have permitted commercial STRs almost everywhere on Nantucket and resident property owning voters would have had their zoning protections stripped away. That is, once again, what is generally on offer at this year's annual town meeting. It was not what Nantucket voters wanted in the past, and it is not what they want now. From past votes, it is clear that voters feel that residential neighborhoods are for neighbors, not for further exploitation. This article provides homeowners maximum flexibility to rent short term, particularly those who live here year round. It also permits off island homeowners who enjoy their home here for a reasonable amount of time each year, the opportunity to increase the amount of time to short term rent if they also rent their property long term or more than 31 days as well. This article is also written to protect homeowners, not commercial STRs, which Judge Vey ruled unequivocally are not a legal principal use in residential zones. <clears throat> I think there's one thing that we can all agree upon. What started as an occasional STR headache several years ago has turned into a monumental migraine for this entire community of property owners. It has also become a monumental migraine for our nurses, our teachers, and security personnel, hundreds and hundreds of them over 600 and others 
who have been kicked out of their long-term rentals in the last few years as properties have been converted into STRs. These are the people who try to keep us healthy, teach our children, and protect us. Is it not time to start prioritizing people, our neighbors, over investors' profits? Finally, the article addresses the issue of summer churn, congestion, and in some cases mayhem, like road rage, by reverting to the Nantucket tradition of a minimum short-term rental of seven days. This will work to reduce stress, permit residents and guests alike to relax and enjoy this island, and return to the civil behavior that we have lost in recent years. Um, I can end this and then we can come back to discussing this in detail, but let me just sum up. These provisions taken together will protect our island community. Nantucket voters don't want to give up their zoning protections to further commercial interests. We want our neighborhoods and long-term rentals back, and we don't want Nantucket's housing crisis to just keep getting worse. As a recent, as a recent speaker at ATM recently stated, Nantucket is a community, not a commodity. We put Nantucket neighborhoods first, definitely support that sentiment. I'd like to give a couple of examples of how. Um, just as a I mean, time check, you're just I'm over. Sorry? Just as a time check, you're just over four minutes. Oh, that's fine. I'll be finished. Okay. okay. Um, number two is obvious. I just told you what that is. That's about um, establishing seven day minimum short term rental. Um, number one is essentially a way, as I said, to permit short-term renters to enlarge the number of days or increase the number of days they have if they long-term rent, which we think would, it won't cure, but it might be a, something of an assistant, uh, assistance, assistance to people who are temporarily, they temporarily need transitional housing. And I think that's about it. Um, any questions from the board for charity? Yeah, yeah. I just on the so I, on the thirty-one consecutive. So, so you're saying if somebody rents thirty-one or more, that counts toward their fifty-six uh, days. Through the fifty-six days, that counts toward what they can then rent. Yeah. So okay. essentially, what it is, you can rent. You, your limit is fifty-six days minus one. Yeah. But if you can't come and do that and you will be willing to rent any time during the year for 31 days or more that would count toward your residential occupancy all right i got it now thanks so so just to be clear a a, a person has 56 days automatically minus one my so it's 55. <laughs> <laughs> okay um, okay. There was a lawyer. Well, that's just, yeah, that's to have principal use one day more than accessory use. Okay. So if they reside in their house 56 days, they get the 55 days. If they rent for one month, 31 days, long term do they, rental, do, do they get to add those? If, so, so if they're in their house 80 days, do they get to rent 80 days or 79 days? Well, not as this is written presently, but I would not be surprised that any of these provisions, if they get onto a warrant, are amendable. And that is certainly one of them. The problem you have is if you permit, um, if you permit let's say, somebody to rent uh, be a short term rent for 56 days or you, or they're they are occupying their home let's say for two months or something like that um, and then you add on all the rental days beyond that you're going to get up to a point where um, you know they'll be up to many many days or months of long term rental in a neighborhood so that is something that we would be happy to 
you know, adjust if we have to. But right now, this is permitting a house, you know, a, a resident or a non-resident to not only rent their house, the rent, they could, let me put it a different way. If they could only come to Nantucket and occupy the house for 15 days, and 14 days is the amount of time that, uh, well, if they could come and say 15 days, let's say, and they wanted to rent long term for 31 days, that would get them up to the 56 minus one. So they don't have to be here and occupy the house for, let's say, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give an example here that explains the use of the 31 uh, consecutive days, but if they have to come at some point to be at the residence, and then they can add on, they can leave, and then they can rent, and then they can get up to 56 days minus one of short-term rental. Okay, so, so just to be clear, if somebody rented six months in the winter, they would be permit, permitted to short-term rent six months minus a day? No, 56 days minus a day. Okay, so it's a maximum of 56 days, period. There's a maximum period. of 56 days. Okay. But it does cover people who can't come here and uh, so that their principal use is greater than what they're entitled to rent. Okay. And, and that's where it gets, it's similar to, I think, what uh, happened with the wards okay. at the grapes. I'm not clear how that helps with year-round housing, but we'll just leave it at that. Any other um, comments from the board or questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, you want to put up the other one we got? And does someone want to speak to it? I, I wasn't really intending to do this, but since this was all coming up tonight, and I, I had, um, after the last special town meeting, I had drafted, I, I had drafted this with John. Oh, I asked him to help me put it in legal form because the the ongoing theme that I keep hearing um, without you know making things extremely complex as many of the proposals that have been crafted that need a lot of time to vet and um, and think about all the different ramifications um, it's really short-term rentals with nu numerous contracts and this was just an idea of saying that there could, you could only have 12 changes in occupancy a year. And maybe 12 isn't even exactly the right number, but that seemed relatively fair. It would discourage the fully corporate rental that definitely has more than 12 changes in occupancy throughout the year. And it would encourage longer stays of occupancy longer rentals, um, which are already being encouraged with the the tax free if you rent 32 days or more. Um, but it gives you somewhat ultimate flexibility that um, that, you know, maybe someone uses their house themselves for two months in the summer, but they want to take an, a number of shoulder season, um, small rentals, they could do up to 12. And um, I didn't, when, I, when we talked about this, I didn't really piece it together with the primary versus accessory use. So this would have to be paired with the approval of it being codified. And, um, but ultimately the, the thing, I think that this is something that people could generally digest, but I, I think that we're very short on time to put anything forward for this town meeting. Okay. Thanks, Don. Any questions? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I do, Don. I'm not sure 12 is the thing, but I like the simplicity of it. I'm not sure that the, the 12 is it. And I'm not sure that it would require, uh, we could make our definition, John will correct me 
if he needs to, but I, we could make our definition of accessory be this definition. Yeah. Or 10 weeks or eight yeah, weeks we, or whatever. We could make some alterations to yeah, this. So that we could, com in, in a way, comply, still comply, you know, not, not open the floodgates entirely, not say that everything on the island can be whatever it wants to be, you know, but we could, something along these lines with this being the definition of accessory may, you know, comply. It's easier to track, uh, say, rental contracts than it is owner use and mm -hmm. the exact number of days that owners are in it and long-term renters are in it and short-term renters are in it. So it's just maybe, and maybe it's a starting point because we're still in a phase of needing to gather so much data. And realistically, I think we're starting to see a little bit of a downwards trend in short-term rentals anyway. So it just may be a, maybe a compromise or a starting point to think about. And if it could, if it could be defined or any of these could be defined and not be complete codification, if we do, you know, I've said from the beginning, if we do that, then we are, you know, it's hard to go back from that. Once you've, once you've said yes and you've made it allowed use, it's an allowed use and it's very hard to change. And so I think that's, you know, one of my concerns. And I think that, you know, that's, I think a large percentage of the voters' concerns. So, and so I don't think that, you know, when we say, oh, it's a compromise and it's a, you know, it's a compromise and it's a first step, I think it's a last step. And I don't think it's a compromise. I think it's a, you know, sort of a capitulation to that, you know, to that side of it. So I think there's got to be something in between. So, thanks. Malcolm, did you want to comment? I was just going to comment that the simplicity of that is attractive. Okay. <laughs> because usually uh, it's very attractive. Yeah. It's getting, it's, we're starting to get there. We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> we're getting somewhere. Um, no, I, I, it's, I'm just trying to, trying to add some levity to a very intense uh, topic. John, did you want to comment? Uh, yes, just just to be clear, Madam Chair, um, I know that this was drafted as an amendment to the general bylaw, but what I understand um, the speaker to be saying is that this would be proposed as a zoning bylaw um, within the definition of accessory use. And of course, that's necessary in order to essentially address Judge Vey's decision. Um, and then the other thing I would say is I, I would recommend adding um, another uh, provision such as Charity has in hers um, that uh, it has to be, the short-term rental has to be operated in accordance with your general bylaw. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, here we are. Um, if the if the select board doesn't have are any you other, listen to Mr. Cohen's changes. Oh yeah, sorry, Stephen. But uh, I I think I, I think I can explain Article Fifty Nine. Just your name for the record, Stephen Cohen. Um, I think a lot of you know I'm an attorney, but I'm not acting in that capacity uh, here uh, for short term rentals. Uh, I'm the sponsor of the article, but I certainly don't want to suggest that it's my article or that I'm the, you know, the leading force behind it. There are a lot of people that are uh, sponsoring it. Um, and you know, I want to be clear with this idea that it is, um, that Warrant Article is somehow trying to make all short-term rentals all legal all the time, when the reality is, is what that Warrant Article does is actually reflect um, the reality of the town's law at the time that it was proposed as reflected by the um, building commissioner and the zoning board four times. Um, and when Judge Bay decided that he wanted to make a different determination, which, you know, his reading of the law is, you know, more, I guess, stronger than mine, uh, you know, that warrant article was proposed as a way to try to deal with what might happen in the ward case. Uh, frankly, because the idea that the ward case might uh, uh, come out was why that was proposed in the first place. And I'm a little disappointed that other people are now seeking special treatment and saying, oh, well, 
you know, we could have done this like Mr. Cohen did, but we didn't. So now at the last minute, we'd like to come in, you know, Charity Benz it could barely explain her article or answer questions on it, but wants to rush in with a special town meeting. Uh, I, I think it's really somewhat offensive to the public and the process. And, I, you know, and I, I'd love to know uh, from the town what it would cost the town to do a special town meeting, because I suspect it's extremely expensive to do a special town meeting on this timeline. Um, but my warrant article, Article 59, has three simple pieces. The first thing it does is clarify the definition of, of commercial activity, which currently excludes residential use of properties, but it, ex it expands the definition of residential use to include rentals, so that rentals would be considered a residential use, not a commercial use, which, which is already what it says, but it says commercial uses exclude rental, exclude residential uses, and it, so it would clarify that residential uses are rentals also. The second thing uh, Article 59 does is create definitions for long-term and short-term uh, zoning, I mean, uh, uses, and then put those in the zoning code in the use, co in the use chart and allow them as uh, uses in all of the districts except the commercial industrial district. Uh, and the third thing it does is require that in order to do short-term rentals, under the zoning code, you would also have to be compliant with other portions of the code, like the, the um, registration bylaw uh, under the Board of Health section. I think it's 123. Um, so it's really very simple in those three ways. Clarifying the commercial use definition, creating short-term rentals as a use, and requiring that in order to do that, you have to otherwise be in compliant with, with the bylaw. Um, if Article 59 is adopted, it does not preclude people from coming back in the fall or whenever to make amendments to it um, or to the bylaw for that matter. There's no, there's no rush. It's not like Article 59, if it gets adopted, is, can never be changed. It can be changed in the fall or next spring or 10 years from now uh, in the same way that uh, it could be changed in, in some kind of special. Uh, and I think that it is unfair to the public uh, to rush into uh, trying to put together alternatives in a way that, that we just went through a four month process of having public hearings on these things. Um, and if I'm permitted, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to, to talk about the other articles that were just proposed. Would that, would that be okay? Um, I, I don't think so. I think no. what okay. we were asking you to do is present like, yeah, I'll, your I'll article rather than have a uh, no, no, no problem. back and forth about the other articles. Um, I would like any other any question? I mean, you have two more minutes if you have anything more to say. <sighs> it's hard for me to give up to the, 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 the mic, but I will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. John, your your hand is still up. Is it perpetually up because you have something no, to say? I keep lowering it after you call me, but it I went up again. I just wanted to make uh, one comment about what Mr. Cohen said. Um, he's absolutely correct that if his article passes, uh, the town could, at a future town meeting, amend the general bylaw by putting further restrictions uh, on um, such as a cap or location or the duration of rentals. All of that could be done in a general bylaw. Uh, from a zoning perspective, if his article were to pass, then um, then um, short-term rentals would essentially be a, allowed as a principal use. If at a future town meeting you wanted to amend the zoning bylaw, for example, to make it an accessory use, we would run into issues in terms of what are legally protected prior non-conforming uses. Um, because, you know, individuals who claim to be legally prior non-conforming to whatever the new accessory use bylaw is, would have to demonstrate that they use the property during that interim period of time as a, um, a principal short-term rental use, if that makes sense. <clears throat> oh, okay, so, so this was a question I posed to you, so I'm gonna ask for some clarification. So, so should 59 pass, Mm -hmm. and define short-term rentals as an allowed principal use in all residential districts. And then we had some definition of an accessory use passed later that was 56 days minus one. And um, anyone who had been short-term renting in excess of the 55 days would then have a, a, a right to continue doing so 
as a pre-existing use that would become non pre-existing non correct. use. Okay. But it would be a legal pre-existing non-conforming use. Now there is some um question as to what constitutes having used your property as a principal um use of short-term uh renting. Uh you know, clearly I think you'd have to have a certificate of registration under chapter 123 of the bylaw. And you'd have to show that during that interim period um, that you were actually using your property as a as a principal short term rental use. So it uh, it it would become a, a bit complicated, I think, to amend the zoning bylaw later um, to address it as a as an accessory use as opposed to the cleaner way would be to do general bylaw regulations. And the, the legislature gave you and every other town in the Commonwealth quite a gift by section 14 of chapter 64 G. We've talked about that extensively, all of the different ways you can regulate short-term rentals based um, uh, through a general bylaw. Okay. Thank you. Matt? Yeah, and my point is that's when I'm talking about this is permanent, I'm talking of it's misleading to say that you can put a Y in the use chart and then you can take it away later. And that's my point is once we put a Y in, it is permanent. And so that's the, you know, and I think it's misleading to people to say, oh, no big deal, just a 50% vote later. No, it isn't because you're going to have a thousand or 2,000 people who have rented in the past who are going to say they're non conforming. Who are going to go out you know are going to challenge it and so i think you know I, my sense all along is to be very careful about allowing this as a primary use everywhere I, and i know that that seems easier for the, even for the planning department for the board of health might seem easier just are oh, we too busy we don't have time to do something complicated like you know matt half and raffer wants or to do something like this because how can we keep track of it well, the reality is, if you know, if we find out we made a mistake and we try to change it, like Mr. Giorgio is saying, we're going to be, uh, you know, we're going to have a thousand non-conforming uses to deal with. You know, we may, so or we're just saying, you know, what we don't really need. You know, we don't want to. We just want to give everyone the right to run this as much as they want. You know, so I think that's where we're headed. That's so one side is saying that, even if they're trying to pretend they're not. You know, and I think that that's not. You know, not in the long term interest of the island. I really don't. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Malcolm, did you have something to tell? Okay. Okay. Um, I am now going to take public comment. Um, oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> I, I am going to, I'm going to alternate between online and at the microphone, and I'm going to start with online, Mr. Atherton. Look, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I right. uh, just sort of jumping back a little bit. Um, I, I've, I've heard that the executive session uh, attended by the select board also had members of the ZBA. I don't know if that's factual, um, but that raises questions in my mind about what was discussed between the two boards, if anything and whether or not that will be disclosed. So I would ask if you might confirm whether or not ZBA members were present and whether or not you will disclose the substance of those discussions. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your comment. It's a little off. I, I understand you're bringing it up, but um, we will get, I'm gonna say we'll get back to you on that. I'm, I, I don't, I think I need to discuss that with Town Council before we talk about executive session. So, um, okay. Hi, Peter Schaefer. I just have a question. Were any of the three additions that were discussed tonight accompanied by 200 signatures? No, no one has requested, uh, no one has submitted signatures for a special town meeting. Okay, so it's a, really a moot point at this point to be discussing that, correct? Unless the select board opts to do it. For to all three? Regardless of whether they have uh, I'm to not going to say about for all three. At this point, the only option for a special town meeting on May 7th is for the select board to call it. Okay, well, I just want to say one other thing. I think 
we get muddy. And when we get muddy, we confuse people. And I think we did that last time. I think it was a short-term rental working group. We had a great plan, and then somebody last minute came up and tried to change it. And I think it confused the audience, confused the people who live in this town, <clears throat> excuse me, and it, it, it made it so that nothing got passed. And we're doing that again. So we better be careful. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm gonna remind everybody, I am gonna keep everybody to three minutes, and then if we're still at it, we can go back around. So, um, all right, next, Kathy Baird online. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll try to be quick here. So I, I think one thing that people ought to know is that just that the lawsuits are still ongoing. The, the fact that the Ward case has been ruled on and, and remanded back to the ZBA does not mean that the other cases have stopped. They're still going on. So the outcomes of them are not unknown. Um, I'm going to bring up some thoughts just I have as a member of the short term rental work group and some of the the um, agony and, and, and thoughts that we went through and just remind people of those that one of the concerns, and I, I, you know, I agree with with Peter that it's the confusion reigned at at town meeting. I think that was one of the big criticisms. People didn't know what was going on. Everything was changing. Last minute stuff was going on, and that was very confusing and not helpful to the process. So, these proposed rules that we've just heard tonight, um, that are last minute, you know, into the to public view, are are not clear. They they all have multiple interpretations, and they're not clear to anybody. Um, even the, some of the people who are explaining them. Um, I think sometimes you need to think about all the different permutations and combinations that there are on this island. There are so many different operational models for short-term rentals that it boggles the mind. And that's one of the things that we learned through public comment. So proponents are claiming to help some of the very people that they will, will end up hurting. For example, you know, owners of traditional individual seasonal cottages on this island, those beautiful little shacks that are not insulated, they're not livable year round. The owners cannot live in them uh, the amount of time that they need to rent them to be able to keep them. So when they get sold, they wouldn't be able to be lived in year round and, and, they, and they would be just bought by someone who would tear them down and build something big and ugly. So we don't want that. I don't think that we do. Um, there may be people who cannot be physically present in their homes. We don't want to have um, people looking in your windows to see if you're there or not. I think that's just opening up the door to even more lawsuits as people will say, well, my neighbor isn't really there, even though they say they're there. So it's just it's just not a good um, a good way to, in, it, there's, there's no way to enforce it, it's difficult. And there's also my concern is that there are really no known or even predictable outcomes to any of the proposals that we heard tonight other than what's already on the on the um, on the on the warrant, because they they rely on you need to have known facts and cause and effect relationships to know. And I think Brooke, you mentioned earlier, we haven't collected the data specific to Nantucket to know what what the impacts will be, what who how many people are affected. We don't have any idea. And I think when you have an economy, whether you believe it's working or not, making changes to it when you don't know what's going to happen. Is, is a dangerous practice. And I don't think that Nantucket voters would want that. Um, and I think there would be a have to be a big bureaucracy to track and confirm compliance and enforcement. Kathy, accessory. Kathy Thank you're you. at three minutes. Thank you. Caroline, Caroline Baltzer. Um, I have many, many, many things that I could say um, as I've been listening very carefully. Um, and obviously it is very intense. Um, and I agree with Kathy that there are so many different permutations and iterations. Um, and when you guys are talking, I think of all the people that I know that it would just, it would wipe out for all sorts of different reasons. And it's so upsetting. Um, for me, uh, I wanna make just one comment. I hope it's as clear as I can be. Um, I'm speaking as somebody who's taught statistics before. I love statistics. I loved that the town brought in a statistician, Matt Heffenreffer of uh, Process First, and I looked at those statistics very carefully, and so did he, and, and so did the short-term rental working group. And the statistics show there's 2% corporate owned right now. So when we talk about corporate, 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 it is a red herring. It is in fact, that is the red herring. And that Reading Herring comes from uh, Act Now. That is where it came from. And I think it's extremely important that we clarify 
where the narrative came from that started the problem in the first place. I have never known, I'm in Brant Point, uh, my grandparents used to rent the house that I'm in, um, rent it out, I do and my mother does. I, I, we've never known a single problem property. I know there are, but I don't know any and I don't know anyone who knows any. Um, that is not me stating that there is no problem. However, the statistics also show that there is no growth of STRs. In fact, there's a decrease. And that's in the statistics. It's not my opinion. And we have NARAB data, and we have process first data. And I think that we need to look at the statistics. And that is where our problem is. We don't want to listen to ACT NOW tell us where the problem is. We need to hear from the statistics. So I ask everyone to remind themselves when we're looking at all these different things, and Matt himself, I'm very surprised to hear that he came up with this um, uh, proposal because it does not correctly presume his statistics. So I, I would really like to ask him about that. When he was the uh, consultant for the short-term rental working group, I asked him, hey, you sit on the land council with um, the founder of ACT Now. Is that going to be a problem in terms of conflict? He said no. This gives a different appearance. So um, I, I really am hoping that the statistics can be re-reviewed so that the problem that's trying to be solved can be confirmed. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I, would I would appreciate very much if people were not commenting about other people during this comment portion. I, I realize I respect everybody's right to free speech, but I think in, in terms of um, our discourse in the community. I want to try to rein that in. I am going to go next to Penny Dye online. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Penny. Great. I have um, a couple of questions. I'll try to make them short and succinct. I also have one comment. Um, through you, Madam Chair, to Town Council, what happens if Article 59 were to pass and then there were new articles that came into place after that. Uh, um, I think when we when we get to a discussion of how we're going to move forward, that's on my list of questions as well, Penny. So, and, and I question? would also, when we're considering that, flip it around. What would happen if some of these alternate articles were to pass, and then fifty nine were to pass? Okay. okay. So, um, another question is. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with the fact that a sitting select board member is, has spearheaded this effort to bring in an article like this outside of the process that everybody else had to follow at the 11th hour. Um, that's not a question, it's a comment. <clears throat> and then also Charity Benz in talking about her article talked about creating year-round housing. I saw no connection there. And lastly, Matt and Matt Heffenreffer, um, when he spoke of his article, said that it takes away the least from existing short-term rentals. And I would make the statement that that's not true. The article that would take away the least would be Article 59, Steve Collins. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Penny. Um, Jim? Thank you. Jim Solzer, retired teacher, former member of the SGR work group. Um, until this evening, the choice at town meeting appeared to be between two opposites virtually no STRs or unlimited STRs with a ban only on corporate ownership. It's crucial to have better alternatives. One way is the simplicity in Don's proposal. Another is Matt, Matt H's uh, attempt to find a middle ground that is reasonable, sustainable, and fair. The STR group I was honored to serve in represented many points of view and backgrounds. Despite our differences, we managed to reach consensus on a vision for STR use on our island that would protect the rental income of island families and protect the small businesses that rely on visitors to the island, while at the same time minimizing the destructive effects of investors converting year-round housing into short-term profit-making machines. Matt H's new article is simpler and more streamlined, and that's good, but it accomplishes the same goals as far as I can see. Accessory use STRs, yes, it allows those. But we all know that's a relatively small number overall, and it's not enough. 
We all know firefighters, electricians, teachers, and hospital workers who have scrimped and saved over time and managed to build a small house or cottage for primary use as an STR. Those STRs have helped pay for their kids to go to college and will allow them to retire on the island, maintaining our close-knit community. Seasonal families, too, rely on STR rentals. Matt's article offers an ingenious way to support those families, those existing primary use STRs, while setting up a carefully considered framework for their reduction over time. So I hope you will support his article, and I like the simplicity of Dawn's, too. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, next up, Peter Holly online. Uh, hello. Hi, Peter. Um, Hi. I, okay. Uh, so Peter Halley, um, uh, I have just a, two, two short comments on this, and they go to Matt's uh, proposal and to Charity's proposal. Uh, first, uh, with respect to Matt's proposal, I totally agree with John Giorgio's comment that it is it raises a, a substantial question mark under the Dormant Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution that needs to be changed if that proposal is ever reduced to a, a, a bylaw proposal. I, I think as to Charity's uh, proposal, it has the same uh, difficulty. Uh, it's not, that may not be apparently clear from reading it the first time or the second time or the third time, but it becomes apparently clear from reading her cover letter uh, that uh, was submitted uh, uh, with the with the article to the uh, board, and, and uh, paraphrase her third paragraph in the cover letter that her proposal favors uh, year-round residents who will be able to rent more days because they live here uh, when renting in the Nantucket tradition and won't have to compete against investors. That is basically a, um, a sort of uh, textbook statement of the dormant commerce clause issue that uh, her proposal as currently written uh, presents. And I would hope that uh, council will look at that uh, carefully too, if uh, these proposals uh, eventually are sent for his review. So those are my, my only comments that uh, both, the, uh, uh, both these proposals have constitutional issues that would have to be cured for them to go further and survive review by the AG's office. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Good evening, Chris Emery, homeowner, community member. Uh, we've been running off and on over the years, some uh, our house and most of the rentals are one to two weeks. I'd be happy to rent for a month, two months, makes it easier, but that's not the way the business is. People come, they can only have so much time to come down here or afford to come down here for so much time. I find short-term rentals is, that's the way the rental market is. And um, I don't want my rights, infringe, our rights infringed on by taking that rental income away. It's been important for our livelihood. We've, we've moved into other houses rented cheaper where it could stay over at Tristram's Landing or something so we could make a, a little extra income by renting our house out. And I think it's become way too complicated. It's, it was very, uh, I don't like the way the whole thing came about, terrible issue. And the, le the least we do to restrict that free trade in our democracy and our capitalistic society uh, I think that's, we got to remember to keep our rights. Thank you. Um, Don, I'm going to take one online and then you can, and then I'll have you come down. Um, Karen Zagaiko. Hello, um, this is Karen Zagaiko, a uh, former member of the short-term rental work group. Um, I just wanted to comment that it just is feeling like this is being really rushed. Um, as we look at the document um, with Matt 
um, having refers uh, proposal, there are just a lot of questions and I understand that it would be uh, potentially, you know, would need to be written into article language in maybe two days if if this special town meeting idea would be going through. And the um, problem is that there are so many things that would need to be more carefully laid out. And maybe you all have been thinking in this direction already. But to me, one of the ones that the short term rental work group struggled a lot with was ownership. And in the document that's presented so far, it just talks about natural persons. But, you know, we spent a lot of time understanding that families have structures like LLCs, trusts, and even um, S-Corps. And we put a lot of language into um, the um, proposals that we made to address some of those things. And so that's just one example. Another is that the document says that, for example, there would be a different structure between um, accessory use and primary use in terms of fees. And I'm not clear as to whether people who could only get an accessory use um, um, permission would be paying more or less. Um, those are just a couple of examples of the little tiny nuances that it seems hard to potentially write into an article within two days. So thanks. Thanks, Karen. Um, I am going to try to wrap this up. Um, I have two hands online, and I think I have three people in the room who want to speak. Um, Dawn's been sitting but had her hand up, so I'm going to have her go. And um, Okay, so I have one more hand online, and I think that's going to be it. So three in the room and three online, and then we're going we're gonna to close the public comment for select board discussion. So go ahead, Dawn. So this... As we've seen tonight, there are so many nuances to this, and I really offered up my article today that I drafted a long time ago um, to show you other choices and that it does need to be something simple, but I'll tell you, even just after presenting that, there are nuances that are already coming up where people do lots of like little short-term rentals in their inclusionary apartment. Um, and it would really disrupt them economically. So, I mean, we, we're talking about a, an issue that is so ingrained into the way people survive on Nantucket, um, whether it's people who live here year round or whether it's people whose families have had summer residences here for 50, 100 years. Um, so, the ultimate question is, does the select board want to call a special town meeting within the town meeting? And I think that it is way too rushed. There's no way to vet all of these out and all of the consequences. We still don't have any data gathered from the rental registry that is just beginning to get up and running and is not even fully functional yet. So I think I think that that's your decision, and I understand that there is the fear about it being codified. But that that article has been there. The lawsuits have been on the table. Uh, nothing else was proposed because it's so difficult to come to an agreement on any of these, even when you come up with something really simplified. Um, if you do bring forward these things within town meeting, I think it's going to create so much confusion that will end up nowhere. I do think that there should be consideration given to calling a special town meeting in an appropriate amount of time where articles can be thought through and vetted, uh, not having to wait till next year. But okay, thanks, Don. That's what um, I wanted to say. Uh, Stephen. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Oh, I was sorry. Oh, the online. I skipped my alternating. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's Bob or Virginia, Vidoni or both. Hi. Yes, this is Bob. Thank you very much for taking this, and I appreciate the emotion and the feelings on on all sides and how difficult this is. But rather than comment on the merits of any of these articles, I just wanted to address. The concept that uh, short-term rentals are a money-making machine and that new short-term rentals are going to pop up on every corner. If you do some math and just do the math and look at 
if you can find a $2 million house today and put 20% down in closing costs, you might end up with a $1,500,000 mortgage. At current interest rates around 6.7%, you can have a monthly payment of around $11,000, including taxes and insurance. <laughs> if you add $30,000 in operating expenses, which is extremely conservative, you're looking at an annual cost on a $2 million house of $165,000. In a 12-week rental season, you would have to get an average of $13,810 a week for 12 weeks for a two or three bedroom house. It's not realistic. Look online, talk to a real estate agent. Houses aren't renting for that. A $2 million house will not get that rent. A $4 million house or close to the median price of a house, you could end up with a $2,500,000 mortgage at 6.7, 8.1% principal interest and taxes, the monthly payments, $20,000 approximately. It's $250,000 a year. You have to rent that house in 12 weeks for 20,000 plus a week. Unless you have a pool and a tennis court and an eight to 10 or a party house, you're not getting that. The numbers do not work. Investors cannot rush in here and just put up short-term rentals. It doesn't work. They can take their money and invest it at 5% in a money market and do much better. It just, the numbers aren't working anymore. Rentals are down about 25% for us this year. People cannot afford to come to Nantucket and pay the prices we have been getting. The COVID bubble has burst. So just do the math and um, deal with that regarding the fear aspect of things coming up everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So I think the articles that we're talking about tonight are uh, solutions in search of problems. I, mean, I don't understand what problems they're trying to fix. Um, Matt's article appears to be trying to limit the number of houses that could be short term rentals and charities article appears to be trying to force both limit the number of days and only to accessory uses. And I think that those are really dangerous things to do. I, I haven't heard why that problem needs those fixes, but let me give you some, some concerns that I have. First of all, if you limit the number of rental days to 55, 56 days minus one instead of 55, I'm not, not quite sure there, but what you've done is say those 55 days are now the most valuable. And so you're going to see a hyper concentration of the, of those days in the, in July and August prices will go way up because availability is down and you'll have no one who's able to rent in the shoulder seasons for weddings or hunting or whatever people do in wine festival and film festival um, because that's not where the money is. The money's in August, right? And, and she's saying you can't have uh, less than seven days. So you can't come and rent a house for a long weekend for a wedding. You got to do a week. Uh, you know, like it, it's not, it's not, it's so, what problem are we solving with those kind of limitations? The other thing is that there are, according to the assessor, 7, approximately 7,400 non-year-round resident, uh, residences on Nantucket. Th those are residences that do not take the year-round exception. And there are about 2,300 houses on Nantucket that take the year-round exception. There are about 2,100 short-term rentals on Nantucket. That means that if only the 2,300 houses that, that have that year round uh, exception are allowed to do accessory uses nearly a hundred percent of the year round houses would be needed to fill the current need of island visitors and um, I assure you that that is not feasible for the people who live in those houses nor are you matching up the people who want to rent them and the houses that would be available if you go with limiting the um, number of short-term rentals to the shyless number that Matt's talking about, you'd have a grandfathered list of about 2,100 people where your waiting list is now uh, uh, 2,100 minus six, so 1,500 people on, on a, um, uh, that would be eliminated before you could get one new one, right? So you'd have a f essentially a 1,500 person list that would have to get eliminated before you got to any new one. And then you'd get down to 600 houses that would that would be allowed to be primary uses so you'd have uh, 600 houses compared to the 2100 that are that are now uh, rented so you've got 1500 houses that don't have it uh, that are currently rented that don't have anywhere to go like 
it's nonsense. Um, they are, these are not well thought through. These need a lot of work. I am not personally against putting correct limitations in place, but I, but I think, you know, frankly, uh, Select McPhee missed the point that John Giorgio was making, which is that the- You're at three. The bylaw amendments in the statute allow us to fix this later at only a 50% okay. margin. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Galen Gardner? Hello. Okay. Can you hear me now? There we go. Go ahead, Galen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, um, certainly interesting discussion. Historically, our mission has been, I guess what our mission has been, is to crack down on corporate rentals and badly behaved tenants. And we find statistically that there, there really is a very a few amount of corporate rentals. And um, I've rented, my parents rented for 34 years. They never had bed tenants. I've rented for 24. I've never had bed tenants. I do my homework. I would like to share this in this forum. I have personally hounded VRBO for years about instant book, which is a feature that lets people just book your house without you having any conversation with them. And guess what? As of yesterday, when I spent hours on the phone with them, they have gotten rid of, you know, pushing instant book. And, you know, they said we heard so much from people like you complaining that instant book does not help communities that we decided to uh, put it in the backseat. So I just want to share that. So that's one small thing and a, a million small things that I've been trying to do around this debate. Um, I really think doing a rush job on the special town meeting just delays the process and the voters that I'm close to are, they are completely burnt out on this issue. I'm burnt out on this issue. I have been reading the select board packet since probably two o'clock this afternoon. Um, many of my friends who are teachers are used as political footballs for housing debates and STR debates. And as a teacher myself, I taught in the public school here for 36 years. I was a single mother. Um, nobody was helping me. <laughs> I got no help whatsoever and that's fine. But Right now, I'm housing a teacher, and in addition to running my STR, I do house teachers. I've housed construction workers. I have summer resident friends who house construction workers in the winter. Um, so what I want to say is these proposals are interesting, but they leave me with more questions. And perhaps the biggest question of all is, are we going to end up with more problems as a result of all the bits and pieces in these articles? Simplicity is really what is needed, and I do commend Dawn for coming up with something simple, but 12 clients is not enough. If you're a landscaper, can you can you survive on 12 clients? If you're a restaurant, can you survive on 12 meals? If you're the hospital, can you survive on 12 patients? I don't think so. Okay, and I'm going to, uh, we need a vote, okay? And I think what we have already is um, is our options for a vote, which would be nice to have. And then, as I've heard in this meeting tonight, we can always go back and attack policy and this and that at a later date. But even when we do attack policy, it has to be simple. And I've got two questions. One, I don't need an answer Alan, to right now. Galen, your, your time's up. Okay, well, here's my question. Galen, okay. three minutes, sorry. We have a three minute limit. Okay, well, you've already taken um, other speakers twice in a row. Galen, I said that I was going to take the last three, and okay, but the policy is three minutes. It's not really fair to have Steve Cohen speak twice and me not finish. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to leave it at that. Three minutes. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just want to just. We, we keep talking about numbers and using, being honest with what numbers say, and then we keep twisting them to make the point we want. And some of these numbers I produce, and so I want to correct them when they're being used to discredit what I'm saying. First, there aren't 2% two, two of corporations. The number, however it was presented, is going to be greater than 2%. And that's important because what we said is there's something like 700 LLCs in the registration, and we don't know what percentage of them represent corporations if you go down the... Um, chain of hierarchy 
So those are that's importantly different. And then the other thing on the number side is when we try to measure a situation and what will come of it, there's a bunch of ranges that something might happen within. Like if we allow for primary use, people to opt into primary use from a legacy point of view, we don't know the exact number. We can get a pretty good sense of a range. But then people like to take one extreme end that will make their point true and stack up a bunch of edge cases until it seems impossible. Uh, and that keeps happening. So I just want to bring that up as we're talking about this. The second thing I'd say, um, there is more detail to the policy I was summarizing and to Karen's questions. The questions she raised would all be acceptable and allowable, but I didn't want to present that level of detail since it was a summary. I think to get into that wouldn't be beneficial. Uh, and then just lastly, you know, whether or not you pursue this in any short timeline, some of the issues that we dropped or we've seen people drop even in the short-term rental work group, someone decided in, um, in a discussion that they weren't easy or they weren't popular and so we've dropped them and moved on entirely, like a cap. Someone said we shouldn't do that and so we moved on, but there have been other people in positions in this town who have said it's a great way forward. And so we shouldn't move past things like um, one interpretation of um, residential, um, you know, residential dwelling because other towns have found ways to get at similar intents within the law. So we should make sure that however we approach those, we don't drop it because it's difficult. We should figure out how to move those forward if they're important. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and Ron Cocott online. And that'll be the last public comment. And then we're going to close public comment for select board discussion. Yes, hi, thank you for uh, taking my comments. I, uh, I just want to comment on articles 59 and 60 in comparison to the proposals we've heard tonight. Now, 59 and 60 have come after three years of not being able to, to agree on anything. Uh, what we attempted to do, and I think uh, Mr. Cohen and the people who helped him out uh, attempted to do was find something very simple, very understandable, something that maintained the status quo uh, in terms of all of the 100-year history of short-term rentals on Nantucket, something that stopped lawsuits, and something that addressed one issue that nearly everyone on the island can agree with, and that is to stop corporations from growing the number of units that they own in short-term rent 100% of the time. Uh, and and also something that doesn't discriminate. Yet I've heard the 59 and 60 described as appealing to the extremes, and I I I, I don't I don't hear that at all as I read 59 and 60. And in the new proposals, I haven't heard a sing. I don't see the word corporations mentioned at all. I, they seem to be targeted at. Seasonal homeowners who traditionally have rented their homes for a hundred years. So, uh, from from that perspective, I think fifty nine and and sixty can get us over this mess with the the lawsuits and uh, with the additional restrictions added in the general bylaws that we can control the growth if there is any of uh, short term rentals in the future and we can get rid of uh, problem short-term rentals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I wanna thank everybody for their um, participation and comments and thoughts and um, ideas. Um, and what I'd like to um, ask the board now is um, thoughts about moving forward in any way, shape or form of, of the options that have and with the complexities that have been presented to us tonight. Oh, well, Madam Chair, there will always be complexities, mm -hmm. even in a simple article. And on uh, Matt's comment about statistics, I totally agree. And it's been a lot of my life looking at statistics. And uh, I just want to warn everyone. Everyone tells me, well, we're sooner going to have all this data, and year we'll, we'll have information. I'm skeptical. It will be what we want. And I'm quite most likely guarantee you that both sides will use it to their own argument. But as far as discussion tonight, <clears throat> uh, if we did have a short or a special meeting, we would have to, in a sense, agree to have all three articles. 
We certainly can't make a decision. I believe first I said maybe we should have a special meeting. I think we need a special meeting, but we don't need a special meeting if we're not ready for it, if the articles aren't vetted properly and discussed. I would support the idea of calling a special meeting as short as possible with the one topic of short-term rentals. Because coming out of the next town meeting, uh, we're going to have to deal with 59, however it goes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I made some notes here. I uh, just want to start by acknowledging everybody who put in a lot of work in good faith on coming up with some proposals for us to consider for a special town meeting. Um, the content and, and the particular provisions aside, it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of people volunteered their time to do it. So we appreciate that. Um, looking back to the work on the short-term work group, our charge was to find consensus and to come up with a compromise. And I think that any article with a good chance of passing town meeting, especially a zoning article, will be a, a compromise or that's, and or that's simple and elegant. Um, I don't think something that's overly complicated with a, with, a, with a short period of time to consider has a high likelihood of passing, again, especially a zoning article. Um, I think that for sh short term, uh, a, a special town meeting inside of town meeting that we're a little tight on, a very tight on time, that there are articles that aren't fully drafted yet and the legality hasn't been completely vetted. Some things came up tonight that probably will need to some revisions. And it's also, and it's it's not nothing but the, the burden on, on town staff to, and, and other town boards to weigh in uh, properly and get their comments and then have that printed up in the warrant, um, et cetera. Um, I'm a little torn here because in the last special town meeting in November, we did have the zoning bylaw and it was similar to Mr. Cohen's article, but it was had, if you will, guardrails on it in the general bylaw was legal, legalize it, stop the lawsuits in one, in one article and then, and then put the guardrails or the restrictions in the general bylaw, which can be changed at a, at a subsequent town meeting by 50% plus one. Um, and so whether 59 passes or not, um, I think that we're, I agree with Malcolm, um, going to have to have a special town meeting probably dedicated to this issue alone in either June or September. I would definitely uh, hear what my fellow board members and also town council and town manager, town staff have to have to say about that, what's even possible is the school available? How does the printing work, the electronic devices, et cetera? Um, but that seems like the better path to consider these potential articles, which are some really good ideas. Um, I think I think Matt's article took a bunch of um, ideas from the short-term winter work group and and worked with a group and furthered a bunch of things. Um, I think Don's, Don's idea is simple and elegant and, and might get some traction with fleshing it out. So I think there's some other potential vehicles there, but it doesn't sound like at special town meeting inside of town meeting on May 7th is the prudent way to go. Matt, thoughts? Yeah, I, I kind of see where we're going. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, that we won't have options for the town meeting I really do uh, I think it's I think last year's short the short terminal work group I think that would have passed you know we went through a process we had two or three meetings here where you know cha some changes were made and if those hadn't been undone at the fin finance committee level I think that would have passed and so you know so I, I do take some offense to me mucking it up I think like we had the short term rental work group in after they all resigned and we're still crafting the article with them here at those meetings. And I, you know, so I think I, I do take offense to that a little bit. Uh, I think it's interesting that we talk about listening to statistics and we have to get statistics, but 
and I, and I agree with that, and I think that's what Matt has been doing as well or better than anybody. Yet the people who are saying that want to jump ahead and put a Y in the use chart. So that they want, so we're going to use statistics because we want a Y in the use chart. It's not, we're going to do statistics to make sure we get something that's going to work for the community long term. And so I, you know, I have some concerns about those, a couple of those comments. Uh, you know, I would like, I see where we're going. I would like to, you know, I would love to have had that chance at town meeting. You know, I would like to think that we would show that leadership and bring that forward. Uh, and then, oh, the other comment is, is sort of, I've worked with every, you know, there was one comment earlier tonight about how it was improper for me to do what I've done. I don't believe that for a second. I've worked with the Nantucket Together people all last summer, talked to anyone that wants to talk to me for any side of this. You know, and if I'm asked to participate and do it, I have done that. And uh, so, I, you know, I find that that, again, that's a little bit offensive. I think I've been working in good faith with all different angles and sides on this to try to find something that works. So, I, I, you know, I, you guys, I've been asking for a few weeks. I see where we're going, but, you know. Malcolm, did you have something else? Yeah. I just, <laughs> I somewhat agree with Matt, and I, I think we, as a group, probably delayed doing something a little too long. Uh, I'm great concerned about the why in the use chart. So I think we need to uh, <clears throat> be ready soon afterwards to deal with appropriately. So I, I would, I came in here thinking I would support uh, a special town meeting during the regular town meeting of kind of moved away from that, but without, I have great concerns about Article 59. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments and then I'll ask what the pleasure of the board is. Um, I, I honestly came tonight with, as a, it, as a person with, of two minds, honestly, I could see the value of going either direction. Um, but I am persuaded by the level of uncertainty and lack of clarity among the people who spoke tonight about and the number of questions. Um, that is what has persuaded me um, that I would not vote for, a, uh, I don't think I'd vote for a special, trying to shoehorn a special into the May 7th meeting. That said, um, I think it's worth this board signaling to the community that we intend to call another special town meeting focused either entirely on this, um, but, and I do want to ask the town manager about the potential plans for a special for other purposes, because I think it's a lot to ask um, town administration to do three town meetings in a year if we were to try to call one if there were going to be another one for um, other town purposes in the fall. And um, I will ask her that question here in a second after I finish. Um, uh, I, th I think that's it. So I'll, Libby, I'll just punt that question to you. We have talked about a special town meeting for an appropriation for the DPW facility. What I don't know right this exact moment is when the best time for that would be because we're trying to time it so that we have a, a solid appropriation number. But we're also going to need an election because it'll be subject to a debt exclusion. So what I was hoping is that we could have, we could time a special so that we could have the election in concurrence with the presidential election. However, in order to do that, we have to let the Secretary of State's office know we're in early August. So I, I need a little time to work with DPW director and maybe town council to pin down exactly what a good time for that would be. I kind of am thinking October, but I know that this is very um, urgent for people. And yeah, we don't really want to have three but we also you know i i just i need a little time to figure out what a good time yeah madam chair i would encourage the town manager to think hard about it because we may have to work quickly after our regular town meeting erica 
I just wanted to note too that it's not just about town administration, it's also about the town clerk. They have a very busy year this year with all the elections and the presidential and the primaries. Um, so we have to work around their schedule as well. Okay. Um, that's part, excuse, that's part of why I was trying to, you know, a few weeks ago, trying to say this, these things are coming and we've got this and let's try to put it together. You know, unfortunately it wasn't noticed right or we didn't talk about it, or we couldn't do it. And here we are sort of on a technicality a few weeks later. I think that's the, anyway, I, I think part of, you know, my concern was putting this together for that reason, but, you know. Okay, so um, does the board wish to take any action tonight um, or uh, do we make a request to town administration to propose potential dates? Do you feel that we should um, do something sooner than the timeline Libby uh, just presented us? Thoughts, actions? Madam Chair, I expressed my view that we need a special town meeting soon. Okay. Do you I want mean, to? I can't. It's up to town manager to give us a uh, okay earliest possible date. Okay. So my, I'm not so sure we will, Malcolm. If we go to town meeting and 59 is passed, and and, and a Y is put in the use chart, I'm not so sure because that's a zoning article. I'm not. I, I think the horse is out of the barn. So, you know. So I think I, I think we're done. Well, well, it's certainly not done because a special town meeting we could propose further um, to to flesh out the general bylaw further to accomplish some of the goals that the short term rental work group um, in their package came up with. So, so that would be the other purpose to have to plan for a special town meeting would be to try to achieve some of those goals through the general bylaw should fifty nine pass. So anyone want to? I just want, Madam Chair, uh, respond to Matt. <clears throat> In some way, I agree with him. I just think we don't have a viable, vetted uh, warrant to put on a special town right. meeting. You know, if I saw something that I agreed with or not disagreed with, but was a vetted good warrant, then I would, I would go with my colleague. Um, so we're not going to take any action on this tonight? I don't think we have. We've made a request, ma'am. Sure. Okay. So uh, do we agree that we've requested that the town manager consider the timeline for a, a special a proposal for a special town meeting? And we can um, re put, put this on our agenda for next week to, if we want to, not, I don't, or again, maybe I, for May 1st. Again, I don't see the point of that. I, I think we're, then we're, we're reacting to something that we don't even like. I think it's important it's on now because we've got competing, it, you know, we've got competing uh, ideas. We've got a town meeting where we're going to be forced to vote on one thing. I, I you know, I, so but I don't see it, it. We I think we have to sort of wait to see what happens with that to then decide, determine whether another meeting is necessary. You know, but and, and again, if people gather 200 signatures, then it's it's going to be out of our hands anyway. So if they feel strongly enough to gather the signatures, then we're going to have to be doing it within a certain amount of time anyhow. I was trying to avoid that, again, by, you know, doing this, but anyway. That is definitely a possible consequence, so. Madam Chair, can maybe we just have a preliminary discussion next week with, after the town manager gets back to us with a universe of potential dates and then see where we're at a week later libby is that possible by next week or or um well may um, may first more likely i mean it if you say do it i'll do it but i am very unclear about what the time frame is because on my end just never mind special town me special um strs I would I was looking at the a fall special for the DPW facility 
and it Can would I ask a host if we're just talking about having a special at what point can i come back to talk about calling a special town meeting that's not specific to the str decision okay um john do you have any thoughts on that did you hear Don's i mean question? i wanted you guys to kind of finish with yep. what you were doing i didn't want to cross a line but if we're just specifically talking about calling a special i'd like to be part of that conversation john do you have any thoughts well, as I've indicated to Don in the past, the decision of whether uh, to approve a warrant um, is she can participate. I, I would say that goes with respect to um, scheduling a special town meeting, but she cannot uh, deliberate or vote on any um, particular purpose for calling that special town meeting, i.e. short-term rentals. So right. that's why I wanted you guys to finish that part. Okay. Well, I, I, I mean, I think we're talking about whether or not to call a special to, to address short-term rentals still is, is, and, and really it's whether, whether we do it in co coinciding with a plan special by town administration for other purposes, but it's still largely about this question. Okay. Um, so if we're, all right, let me, let me be very precise in my question. Does the board wish to schedule a special town meeting sooner than fall to discuss this? Is there an interest in doing that? I have interest in doing that. Whoever the outcome of 59, we're gonna to have to deal with that outcome. And if 59 passes, the outcome is not gonna be necessarily good for us, I believe but that may be what we have to deal with. If Article 59 fails, we still have done nothing. Yep. You know, we have to define accessory use somewhere along the way. Yep. And it's, I think there could be more chaos if we're just waiting around till September. Madam Chair, that also only gives any potential drafters of any articles a Very couple sure. months to come up with something concrete and have them vetted by town council and planning board fincom etc yeah. yeah, madam chair we had starting on two tonight okay so yeah erica Sorry, I have a question for town council. If you decide to have a separate standalone special town meeting, do we then have to open the warrant for the public? And could it be non STM articles that get added to that, which defeats the purpose of that? Yeah, John? If you, if you would have to open it up for petitioned articles, but unlike an annual that only that only requires 10 signatures, if the select board calls a special, it would require 100 signatures. But if that's submitted uh, in a timely fashion, that would have to go on the warrant. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I would recommend when you do your schedule um, for the town meeting that the board, as you always do for the annual, you set the deadline for the submission of uh, petitioned articles. I'm not convinced doing a meeting even in June is going to give the community time to to settle on a proposal. Um, it it's I mean what I know the town meeting timeline is, and we're going to have town administration working on ATM between now and and May seventh. So and FinCom is still meeting on warrant articles for ATM. So uh, I don't know what that calendar looks like. I'm, cer I'm certainly not prepared to pick a date tonight, but um, personally. So anyway, um, in the absence of a, a, a motion or a, a proposal for action, um, I would close this topic. Yeah, yeah. in the other, just another, a comment on this, I, like thinking about it, 
this is going to this is going to be difficult and i think part of the difficulty is that we're giving this you know sort of the way this has been handled it's been kind of well you know and we've tried to get a group together and i think they did a really good job but i think the other stuff counting we're counting on individuals and it's kind of how do we pull it together so that you know so say it does if it i'm concerned it will fail at town meeting 59 will fail and that will the people will be concerned and how do we you know and that's one of the things that we were trying to address but i also think we have to figure out what is the process because i think there was some good you know i know a lot of matt a lot of the things that people thought were problems with matt half of half his articles are not problems and a lot of the things that people think were going to impact them were in, in fact not going to be impacted by how he's proposed it i think that trying to do it tonight in a couple hours on a wednesday night is it didn't isn't conducive to people even understanding what's there and i think there's some people who don't want to understand it are going to complicate it on a wednesday night or at a town meeting because they have self-interest and they're trying to do that so as a, what my thought is how do we as a you know as the board of as a you know leadership in the board of this community how do we you know get through that self-interest and through the dis you know un, un, not understanding and through you know all the other stuff that we have to wade through to bring something that is good for the town and good for the you know staff and good for the town and good and protects people you know and i think in a way we you know because we ducked this early on and i think it's come back i always tell my kids when you avoid something it comes back and it's worse and i think that we've kind of have you know have sort of ducked this and hoped that it would fix itself so whatever we do i hope we find a way to you know to fix it to to you know and i don't know the answer to that but we but i know there was a lot of good stuff in Matt half and raffers that would would work and okay. and i feel like we're just throwing it out okay well it doesn't tom yeah madam chair it seems it seems like the maybe not the only but the most obvious prudent way of proceeding would be as the town manager said for a potential special town meeting in October that would focus on the DPW facility and any potential short term rental articles and then any citizen war articles who met the higher bar of the 100 signatures. Okay, so um, unless anyone wants to propose an action tonight i'm going to close this and bring Don back for committee reports. Madam Chair, could I just clarify what uh, Libby's going to do now? We asked her for dates, and now we said we're not going to do anything till October. I, I mean, no one here has proposed anything. So until someone says, I would like this, you know, makes a motion or, or proposes an action, I am, I'm here waiting well I would propose that the town manager uh, come back within uh, two weeks with a timeline for the earliest possible special town meeting okay irregardless of just assuming that the town clerk and staff had nothing to do okay. and then we could go from there okay we have a meeting next week and then we're two off for two weeks so why don't we say for May 1st for May 1st. Okay. May I please clarify that? So by earliest possible, do you mean that meets all of the local requirements? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, is that, is that, is there consensus from the board on that? Matt? I don't think it's necessary until we know what the vote is, but yeah, I'll, I'll go with it. I'd like to start thinking about it and planning it. No, thinking about it is good. All right, okay. I'll support it. Okay, so preliminary um, ideas of timelines for, for special town meeting May 1st is the request to town administration. Well, I mean, you probably want to have that question answered in case, for whatever reason out there, um, someone gets 200 signatures and calls. And... Right, and there's that, okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Don, I happily hand the chair back to you. Are there any you. committee reports? Um, OIH spent again yesterday. Everything is progressing. We have a timeline of meetings set up for the next few months. There will be 
um, information at town meeting, somewhere where it's appropriately set up um, to get kind of the word out on where that's heading if people Thanks. don't didn't watch the presentation last week. Anything else? Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, so moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That carries unanimously. Thank you. It's done only. Thank you for showing me that. <laughs>